baby reindeer. That's all anybody's talking about. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Fiona Harvey. She's supposedly the uh, star of the movie or the co-star. Guess my play in her. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Simply, this is an interview with Piers, and he is talking to the woman who supposedly is the, the genesis of the story, Baby Reindeer. She outed herself after a whole bunch of people on the Internet sleuths started to poke on her and make it clear that she had no other choice. And this is that interview. In her first television interview, she joins me now in the studio. Well, uh, thank you for joining me, Fiona. Um, First of all, why have you decided to go public? The internet sleuths tracked me down and hounded me and gave me death threats, so it wasn't really a choice. I was forced into this situation. What do you hope to achieve in this interview? I came on your show because you're a veteran broadcaster. I think you'll give me a fair hearing. Um, you were persecuted yourself not so long ago. Um, so that's why I've chosen this show. Have you watched the drama? Not at all. I've heard about the court scene, about the jail sentences and all this sort of stuff. But you heard... really haven't watched any of it? I haven't watched any of it. You're not curious to? Uh, no, I think I'd be sick. Um, it's taken over enough of my life. I find it quite obscene. I find it horrifying, misogynistic. Some of the death threats have been really terrible online. People phoning me up. You know, it's it's been absolutely horrendous. I wouldn't give credence to something like that, and it's not really my kind of drama. All right, Greg, what do you got? This is going to be a good opportunity for us to look for a baseline because it's just asking why did you come in and that. But there's also going to be an opportunity here to mix in some other things. So we look when we say baseline, we're looking for what's normal for a person in this situation. Not when you're sitting on your couch eating Cheetos, as I always say, but in this situation. So we hear speech patterns sentence completion, pitch, tone, and cadence. And we look for illustrators of the way a person punctuates what their brain is thinking with their hands, face, and body. We see a lot of that. I also very quickly start to see something that I've seen many times in my life. I often find people who have borderline personality do, and that doesn't mean this is what she has, but I often find it is that need to get approval so they suck up very quickly. We're going to listen to her because she has these elongated vowels. And I know everybody's going to say Scots have elongated vowels. True. But hers are at specific locations, specific locations. So they indicate something when they come at those specific locations. We'll try to find where she's got this accommodating behavior. We see it in this first video when she elongates those vowels. And then she's got some thought interruption instead of complete sentences. She throws out something that's baited to see if you like it. If you respond appropriately, she moves on. If not, then she kind of stalls for a minute and tries to fill in more details. That's not a good start right out of the gate for me. There's a posture change when she says, I haven't watched any of it. Big posture shift when she says, haven't watched any of it. Why? That's a deviation from baseline. Everything else she's done is not like that. And then when she says credence, I don't give those things credence, there's a very nervous smile, which indicates that she's uncomfortable with that answer or something's going on. I think we're going to see a whole lot of circus under this tent and we just need to hang on and watch. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, nice. Uh, I'll come to borderline personality disorder a little bit later on. Not by any means saying that this person, this subject has that, but we certainly will talk about that. Like right at the start, look to camera and then head and eyes go into shade. I would suggest that shame right from moment one, an element of shame right from moment one. And to your point, Greg, this very interesting, what we would call in paralanguage, Prosody, which is the stress, the intonation and the rhythm with which this person, this subject is speaking. Now, yeah, her accent is from Aberdeenshire. It's a Scottish accent and a very specific Scottish accent. But this prosody is way outside of that. And in fact, I would suggest that it's a prosody that you'll often find associated with a neuropsychiatric condition called autism spectrum disorder. Now, I'm not saying that's what she has. I'm saying the the rhythm of her speech, the intonation and the stresses in it is often associated with that. So that's worth keeping in mind as we go along. Just a little bit about AS, uh, ASD, uh, often associated with a social disability, uh, obsessive interests, difficulty with theory of mind, which is really understanding what somebody else might be thinking or feeling and uh, often associated with ignoring consequences, not quite able to understand what the consequences of actions may be, especially around people's thoughts and feelings. Uh, now, uh, ASD 
also has some symptoms which are similar to um, narcissism, but they are completely different things. The two things are not associated in any way. Look, that's just my opinion on what we're seeing there. You take a closer look, see what you think, and we'll talk more about these possibilities as we go further along. Chase, what do you got on this one? Today's video is sponsored by Aura. I'm excited for this because I've been using this app for over two years. If you didn't know how much private information is out there on the internet about you, when you first see it, it's pretty shocking and maybe a little disturbing. These people that collect all these private things about you are called data brokers, but there's a secret here. They have to take down your information if you ask them to, so they make it incredibly hard to do. So what we do is let Aura handle that for us, and you can do the same. You can let Aura do all the work tracking down and removing all the stuff that you don't want online. And you can try Aura for two weeks for free using the link uh, right at the top of the description down there. And Aura does a ton more than just getting your information off the internet. They protect you from threats that you and even your kids can't see coming. And it's super easy to set up. You don't have to go download a million different apps to get all the benefits that Aura has, like parental controls, antivirus, VPN software, password management. They even have identity theft insurance everything. One of my friends was over here sitting in this office just a week ago, and I typed his name in, and within just a few minutes, we found everything. Even his anonymous accounts were on the dark web and the passwords associated with those. He downloaded Aura that night. So you should look into this. Your private information should be private. You can go to Aura.com slash TBP, just like the behavior panel, TBP, right now to start a free two-week trial that I've also linked down in the description. Yeah, I was definitely going to mention the ASD spectrum because there's a lot here and we're going to see a lot more in a, in a few minutes. I think it's interesting. She uses the term internet sleuths, not people on the internet, not a-holes on the internet. She almost brings credibility to it, which I thought that was interesting. Uh, so if this is truthful, let's take a look, Greg, and add a few things onto this baseline pile uh, that you were talking about. And there's some really good data points here. There's baton gestures. And baton gestures are something that we do when we're speaking truthfully, when our hands are doing this to the rhythm of our voice. And then there's upward tonality when she's finishing sentences. And these little fragments of sentences, you'll see this little upward tone at the end, trying to like Greg said, kind of a, a getting approval very rapidly. And she uses gave me death threats instead of threatening to kill me or sending me death threats, gave them to me. Maybe this is a cultural thing. Let me know in the comments. Maybe it is. But she punctuates with her eyebrows very often. This is something that we see her do in this video when she's saying things that are probably truthful. And she's leaning in on what she sees as important statements uh, and she desires to correct the record rather than remain private and silent. That is interesting. And that is going to unfold like crazy in the videos that we're about to show you. And as I understand it, she's the person who made this information public or decided to do it. Uh, and she desired to share this with the world. And if this is the case, we may be seeing a desire for significance so powerful that whether it's negative or positive is irrelevant to this person's brain. So some of the statements she made seem to potentially indicate she's overemphasizing the popularity of the case. And then she says, it's not my kind of drama in this clip. It's not my kind of drama. I'm curious as if this is just offhand or if maybe this is something's being revealed. So we'll have to see the next one where we will definitely go deeper on this. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think we're going to take a very interesting stroll down behavior lane on this one because we're going to see things we haven't seen before. Uh, specifically, a couple of them. I won't hit them all. But some things we're going to see that are odd or that are that are out of place, for example, is that big gasp she takes quite often. And as it goes through, it just gets bigger and bigger and louder and louder. When she's getting ready to speak, she goes... Tum. I know at the very end, the last video, it's fascinating because she's supposed to address the, the uh, camera and tell you, the viewer, what you, you know, what she thinks about what's happening. And she takes a gasp. That's unbelievable. You won't want to miss that. It, it's, it's so big and so loud. It looks like something went wrong and she's scared almost as she goes through that. 
So, and that happens right before she answers the questions. And I'm under the impression it's, it's, it's part of her baseline, but I think she does that to take up a little time to think up the answer to what she's going to say as, she, as she's structuring it. I see a lot of the eyes darting back and forth. That doesn't mean a whole lot, except that she's processing, she's thinking as eyes go around. A lot of people think when you break eye contact, you're not being honest and all that. We talk about that all, all the time on here, but we know that's not true. But when you're looking around, you're thinking. So when someone it seems like their eyes are darting and they stay for a while, not just going back and forth like that, but if they're going and staying for for even a fraction of a second, that lets us know they're processing and they're thinking about something. Again, like you guys were talking about, we see that head go back and that chin come forward, almost like she's angry. It's like there's pent up anger in 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 this personality type. Another thing, listen for the humming. She goes, mm, she starts this really odd humming as um, Piers is talking, you know, even as he begins the questions. And it's in one way you could say, yeah, she's going, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the tone of them changes throughout this uh, series of videos we're going to watch as well. And some of them get so long and so loud. It just, I don't know why he didn't stop and go, what are you doing? This is weird. You, you got to quit doing that. We're picking that up, you know, but he doesn't. But it's really loud and it's really odd. It's really weird. So, and at some points, her, her blink rate goes way up and then it comes way down. And then she's almost given that psychopathic stare sometimes. She's not, that's not what it is. But she she gives a hard stare at it. But I think at that point, she's trying to get all the information she possibly can. Because on a lot of this, I think she was ready with her answers. I think a lot of this stuff was prepared, but some things weren't. Because he's he does such a great job in this at asking her the right questions. And when she doesn't answer... Now, she gives him something that where she kind of jumps to the side and tries to get past it. She chaff and redirects. He's not having it. That's one great thing about him. You don't ever want to let this guy interview if, be you if you've done something wrong because he's not going to let you get away with uh, a close to the answer. He's going to be right on you and, and see if he can get you to answer it. So those are some of the interesting things we're going to say in, see in this. And if you guys are good, we'll move on. Hey, I got one question. Chase and I... Both immediately had the same thought. Do you guys have the same thought? Does she look familiar to you? Humalians. Humalians. Chase said it, and I said it to you before I called him. I said, it's not just how she looks, because I didn't even think about looks. It's yeah. a whole lot of other stuff, behaviors. Yeah. Behavioral type. So we're referring to a, a video that we did before where a woman had claimed to have had children with aliens and children that were called humalians. And we did this episode and we recognized very similar behavioral patterns. So a lot of Which, s- similar quirks and styles. Jane said, Pooley. Jane Pooley. Who having said children. that, she may be the daughter of that woman. <laughs> in her first television interview, she joins me now in the studio. Well, uh, thank you for joining me, Fiona. Um, First of all, why have you decided to go public? The internet sleuth tracked me down and hounded me and gave me death threats, so it wasn't really a choice. I was forced into this situation. What do you hope to achieve in this interview? I came on your show because you're a veteran broadcaster. I think you'll give me a fair hearing. Um, You were persecuted yourself not so long ago. Um, So that's why I've chosen this show. Have you watched the drama? Not at all. I've heard about the court scene, about the jail sentences and all this sort of stuff. But you really haven't watched any of it? I haven't watched any of it. You're not curious to? Uh, No, I think I'd be sick. Um, It's taken over enough of my life. I find it quite obscene. I find it horrifying, misogynistic. Some of the death threats have been really terrible online. People phoning me up. You know, it's it's been absolutely horrendous. I wouldn't give credence to something like that, and it's not really my kind of drama. You first met him. I mean, the, the, the show shows you coming in to a London pub. Mm-hmm. You've just named the pub, mm-hmm. and he's working behind the bar, Richard Gad, and he offers you a cup of tea. Is that what happened? No, that's not correct. Um, he didn't offer me a cup of tea. Nobody gets anything free from the Holly Arms. Um, I was in for a meal with... Um, a drink of lemonade, and I was very, very hungry. I'm diabetic, so very hungry. So that that's And did you true. talk to him? Um, he interrupted a conversation. There was another barman there. And he said, oh, you're Scottish, and basically commandeered the conversation. I, you know, I was talking to somebody. It's pretty rude to interrupt. So he seemed to be obsessed me, with me from that moment onwards. I mean, just speaking to you, I never met you before, mm-hmm. but you do look and sound very similar 
to the actress in the I drama? Haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen the actress. We're both Scottish. We've both got dark hair. Um, she's considerably younger than me. I think she's about 18 years younger than me. Mm. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 58. I'm mm. a year younger than you. Mm. And I think Martha, Jessica, the actress, is about 40, mm. 38, 40. It says in the show that you proceeded to return to the same pub time and again, but you never paid for a drink. I don't drink alcohol. and Did you pay for anything that you had? Uh, lemonade or soft drinks. Would he give you free drinks? Or? No, absolutely not. This is sort of a depiction of me as a pauper who wouldn't stand around or stand a drink. Like, it's nonsense. It says that you told Richard Gadd that he looked like a baby reindeer toy you once had as a child, hence the name of the show. Yeah. Is that yeah. true? I, I, appear, I appear to have uh, written most of the show in my sleep. Um, I dressed um, the... Uh, but did you have a baby reindeer I toy? I had a toy reindeer. So that's true. And he shaved his head. That bit is true. Mm. And there were reindeers in the shops. It was Christmas time or something. It was a joke. So I have inadvertently penned the name of the show. Right. But that is true. That's true. That's that's true fact. All right, Mike, what do you get? Uh, yeah, so this idea of her being connected to baby reindeer. Uh, Piers says, so that's true. She says, that's a true fact. Now, that's really important that we've got facts and we've got truth. And how is truth connected with facts? A fact, in my opinion, is uh, an indisputable observation, usually by three or more people indisputably, we can see something to be or not to be, essentially. Now, the truth is saying or writing down that indisputable fact. She's saying when it comes to this idea of, of naming the writer Baby Reindeer, that is a true fact. It is indisputable that that happened, and she's saying it right now. So that's a true fact. Now, this is important because... That's, Arist uh, that's Aristotelian logic, by the way. Netflix says at the start of this that this is a true story. So they're saying at the start of this in black and white that it is a communication of indisputable fact. Now, what we also have to realise is at the end of the Netflix show, they then say it's based on a true story. At the start, they say it's a true story. At the end of it, they say it's based on a true story. Now, it's a dramatic convention at the start of something to say this is a true story, rather like sometimes a magician in a magician show on TV will say, I'm not using any, uh, any stooges. All of these people are members of the public. They're not. They're all actors. The reason yeah, what does he say that? Remember what he says before that? He says, I'm not, I'm not a mentalist, I'm not anything. And he tells you he's going to do that, and then he does it. Right. So in drama, that it's a convention. It's a convention to say this is a true story, and we're meant to know that's a convention. It's not a true story. And they cover themselves at the end. Okay. So all of that being said, let's talk about delusional disorder. Delusional disorder is, is when... Um, is when you put forward indisputable facts in front of somebody and they don't believe that to be the truth. It doesn't matter how many facts you put in front of them, they will fight and fight and fight that the truth isn't attached to that. So my question is, who has delusional disorder here? Is it Gad, the writer? Is it Harvey, the person that we're watching here? Or is it Netflix? Because I could pretty much say all of them are putting down what they think is indisputable facts as the truth and vice versa. It's very hard here to work out who has a fact and who has the, the truth. Now, let's just talk a little bit about delusional disorder. It is linked to uh, ASD. It is linked to PTSD. It is linked also to corporate psychopathy as well. So all of those all of those can have delusions in some way and not really know the difference between fact and truth or put fact into truth where it shouldn't be there. Uh, delusional disorder is a very vulnerable mental illness, by the way. Anyway, all of that, just my opinion. Take a look yourself and see what you think. But I think there's possibly some delusional disorders going on, maybe with everybody involved in this. Chase, what do you got on this one? Wow, that was deep. That was deep. 
So right away we see this chin thrust. And this means or indicates she might be willing to accept a challenge as the initial question is, is laid out by peers. And she uses uh, another phrase here. He seemed to be obsessed with me from the moment or from that moment onwards. Right as she says the statement, I have never seen a rapid spike in blink rate happen so fast in my lifetime. She went from a 13 per minute to over 90 a minute. That Our average blink rate is about 17 per minute. And stress is in the mid 30s. Severe stress is like 70s and above. 90 and upward is considered what I would consider eye blocking to the point high stress to where the person is blocking their eyes. And when we eye block at this point, there's hesitation, there's uncertainty with the topic. They're uneasy when saying something. And we also in this category would be deception and sometimes false humility. But that's, I don't think that's what we're seeing here. With the behavior that we are seeing here, there is a red flag about these free drinks. I have no idea how relevant that is to the story. Maybe we'll find out. The blink rate is super high again through the roof. There's chaff and redirect, as Greg says all the time. There's a non-answer statement. There's down left avoidance, not accessing, but avoidance. I'm avoiding eye contact in a certain direction. And she took offense at the perception of it, uh, not the material fact, which might shed some light on this for us to see why she might be here in the first place. And because she uses the phrase, this depiction of me as a pauper. So she got free drinks because she was poor, not because there was some relationship. That's very interesting. And how do you have a toy reindeer that shaves its head? She didn't say I shaved its head. She said it shaved its head. Who shaved his head, I think. And she, she said, admits to the reindeer, then backpedals on the re relevance of everything Come, uh, just claiming she's got no idea, except she admits it all is true at the same time. So it, that just reminds me, if you subscribe, you're going to get a lot more notifications when our videos come out, which is next week when our video comes out, you'll get a notification for that. It's going to blow your mind. And if you didn't know, we release videos on Thursdays at 1230 Eastern time and subscribing is free. Greg? Yeah, great call out and all that stuff. I agree. What's interesting to me, you started off this by saying when people have borderline personality, often they desperately need approval and they plug into all your receptors. Look, that doesn't mean a person is broken because they have borderline personality. That's something we get. Each of us gets different neurotypes, different things, different capabilities. All those have value in some capacity or we would not end up with them where we are today. The most important part of that is simply to say you aren't what you get, you're what you do with what you get. So I don't want anybody to hear that as a defect. However, when I'm looking for patterns of behavior, I'll go, I've seen this before, and here's why. I interrogated prisoners for a long time. I saw a lot of people with different kinds of things. They left corporate. I left there and went to corporate America, worked there for 20 plus years, saw a whole lot of different things there, some of which we would have called ailments or illnesses in the real world, in the regular world. But Mark, to your point, there's all kinds of places this stuff plays out. What I see here is a person who wants to give you information, came with a tape to play, but is afraid of disapproval and uses every attempt to try to hide from that disapproval. If you don't believe that, watch when she's asked about the baby reindeer. I don't, I don't know that she's even chaffing. I think it comes off as chaff and redirect. I think she's insulating with ancillary detail to avoid judgment. And what I mean by that is they soften the eventuality that they did something. You see it all. Here's a good example. Well, I was there and there was a car crash, but I can't say I caused it. But I was driving and the car that I was driving struck it. That is what we're hearing here is that slow, gradual acceptance of being involved. And that usually I associate with a person who's fearful of condemnation. And I see it. All, I've seen it many times in interrogations. You have to give them an out. And that path will come back up. We'll hear her trying to run that tape that he won't let her run more than one time. I think, Chase, the reason we see all that blink rate increase around the free drink, he never said it was free, not once. He said he offered you a drink. She says it wasn't free. And the reason I think she says that is because she has watched this video. And in the video, he gives her a drink. And so there's her first lie. And we get to see a blink and a deviation from baseline. The other thing is this. 
I'm pretty damn good at planning and preparation before I speak to anybody, anybody. I don't usually find out how old they are. She knows how old Piers Morgan is. Hmm. I would be a little concerned how much work somebody's doing when they come in with that. So there's a whole lot going on here. Yeah, there is a version of chaff and redirect, maybe not intentional. But when a person feels so obligated that they need you to approve of them, they're going to go out of their way and because the organism does what made the organism successful. She's probably done this many times, and it's likely not intentional. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree with all you guys are talking about. And when she first comes in, that head is so far leaned back and that chin is so forward. It is, it's just bizarre looking. That's so unnatural. We do a lot, a lot of TV and we're on here a lot. So we're, we're used to trying to at least pay attention to what we look like. I've never seen her on TV before. Maybe she has been or something, but I would at least think you would think about your look before you went on there, before, before that started. Anyway, so when she comes out of that and that head comes forward, she does this really odd. And now listen to this and watch for it when you watch this uh, replay here just in a couple minutes. Because when her head comes forward, she does this thing. It sounds like it's like a frog catching thing. It's like her tongue comes out and she makes this little shush sound and squinches her mouth up. It's it's so odd to see this. It, it's like she's trying to catch a fly. I'm not trying to be funny. This is what it looks like. So watch that when it's at the very beginning. When it uh, when you when you watch this uh, replay, so it may be a tick. I don't know. But we won't see an opportunity to. We won't have the opportunity to see that because it, we won't have enough time for it to bloom for her to relax enough to get into that. Because things haven't, the stress hasn't risen as high as it's going to raise yet, as as it's going to go yet for her. So that's sort of when, um, at this point, she's still she's not relaxed, but comparatively she's relaxed. So you're going to watch her get the stress increase as we go along. Um, and then when she says, from that moment onwards, the S at the end of that, unbelievably long. And she makes this, again, she makes this shush sound uh, right after that and squinches her mouth up real tight. It's just odd behavior. I know I'm focusing mostly on, on, on body language, but these are the things that tell us something may not be right here from an emotional standpoint. And you guys are talking about the personality type, so, uh, and you've eaten all the info of, <laughs> on, the way to, on the way to here. So I'll... I'll so when I'm last, I'll just focus on that. And uh, so I think that's really fascinating as well. And and Chase, like you were talking about where she's she says, um, had a toy reindeer and he shaved his head. That's what it was. I'd listened to it a couple of times as well. So I was wondering, who is he? She She's not, uh, she's living that thing as she's talking about it. She's in that little world as she's talking about it. I don't know how to explain that any better, but I've talked to people like this before. So I know what that looks like. That she's she's seeing that reindeer and she's and she's remembering what happened to her that situation but she's talking about it uh in a different way i don't know how to ex how to explain that the best but it's that's why she says uh and he shaved her head or shaved his head or its head so i think that's what's happening there all right oh man I'm going to go with Chase on that one. You know, he shaved his head thing. One way that I read that is she's talking about Gad. That's mm, what I thought, maybe, too. Maybe, maybe, he yeah. shaved his head. Maybe that so made him had, look like a He had really deer. short hair or bald head. Oh. And the baby reindeer model had yeah. a had a bald okay. head. That and makes so sense. it was like baby reindeer. But I think there is, there's some deeper significance in baby reindeers that I'll, okay. I'll come that to. That would make sense. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Did, I did, did that's I, did I ever tell you guys the G.I. Joe story? No. <laughs> this is a funny story. When we, I was about 10, my brother was six. We got G.I. Joes with the hair and all that kind of stuff, you know? Hunk for and my, my, my niece, uh, my brother's, uh, my dad's brother's kids live next door. And they kidnapped G.I. Joe and gave him a ransom note and said, you'll never see him again if you don't do this. <laughs> so he never did give, come up with whatever they told him. So they found him in the ditch with his limbs missing and shaved with a knife and stuff like that. And he always accused me of it forever. Didn't have any part in it. So when he was about 50, I bought him the same G.I. Joe for Christmas and gave him all that stuff. And he was he still got it in a cabinet at his house. So for 40 years, he's carrying this thing about Greg shaved my G.I. Joe. <laughs> wow. And you grew up to be a bald guy. Yeah. yeah. Captures people. Yeah. What goes around? Well, maybe there's some truth. <laughs> maybe he scarred me for life. I'm suing him. We, we, it, our first action figures turn out to be us I'm, I'm sure so my favorite action figure was was action man with the sub the sub uh mariner the, the diver action man who had a jacques cousteau ploprof and now 
I have oh, there you go. the Jacques Cousteau Plo Prof. So we're all Jacques. we're all really the uh, the making of our early action figures. I would say who's two, Action two Man. I don't know Action Man. Well, it was it was the British GI yeah. Joe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, same yeah, thing. You couldn't have GI Joe. Um, army guy. I mean, he, he, depending on on how you dressed him, he could be Army, Navy, Air Force. Mm. I don't think anybody oh. bought any of the Air Force. Did, stuff. He, did he have Kung Fu grip? No, no. I'm gonna have to. No, I'm gonna have to tell you this. They would, up, they would degenerate have, very quickly. We need to have GI Joe and Action Man fight because I know GI Joe is going to win. Kung Fu grip every time. No, possibly. Grip. Possibly. Uh, he's going to win. But he's then, but then I'd play man. my six million dollar man. You see. Then oh, I just I've got brother has that man, too. Then, I gave it to him. Give it I to would, him. I would sort it the out. Eye in the back. You could look through. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was brilliant. Just made everything small. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it was just it <laughs> the absolute opposite of what it should be doing. <laughs> Here's one you guys won't know. I don't think anybody on here will remember this one. There's a there's a cat named Major Matt Mason. He was he was one of the Apollo astronauts, you know. But he had like a moon crawler and all this stuff because he was really into to, to the astronauts when I was a little kid. And uh, Major Matt Mason. Yeah, he was, was he awesome. one of those that his arms didn't bend and stuff? No, he, he, he was. You I do? Own, I own an original. It's thirty feet away from me right now. I've oh, got cool. that stuff too, like the the moon crawler and the big ball he would get in and roll around on the moon. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I've got all mine in the basement. Yeah, I've got all that stuff. Yeah, it's even work still. Collecting memorabilia for things that never happened. You first met him. I mean, the, the, the show shows you coming in to a London pub. You've just named the pub, and he's working behind the bar, Richard Gad. And he offers you a cup of tea. Is that what happened? No, that's not correct. Um, he didn't offer me a cup of tea. Nobody gets anything free from the Holly Arms. Um, I was in for a meal with um, a drink of lemonade and I was very, very hungry. I'm diabetic, so very hungry. So that, that's And did you true. talk to him? Um, he interrupted a conversation. There was another barman there. And he said, oh, you're Scottish. And basically commandeered the conversation. I, you know, I was talking to somebody. It's pretty rude to interrupt. So he seemed to be obsessed me, with me from that moment onwards. I mean, just speaking to you, I never met you before, mm -hmm. but you do look and sound very similar to the actress in the I, drama. I haven't seen the actress. We're both Scottish. We've both got dark hair. Um, she's considerably younger than me. I think she's about 18 years younger than me. Mm. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 58. I'm a year younger than you. Mm. And I think Martha, Jessica, the actress, is about 40, mm. 38, 40. It says in the show that you proceeded to return to the same pub time and again, but you never paid for a drink. I don't drink alcohol. and Did you pay for anything that you had? Uh, lemonade or soft drinks. Would he give you free drinks? Or? No, absolutely not. This is sort of a depiction of me as a pauper who wouldn't stand around or stand a drink. Like, it's nonsense. It says that you told Richard Gadd that he looked like a baby reindeer toy you once had as a child, hence the name of the show. Yeah. Is that yeah. true? I, I, appear, I appear to have uh, written most of the show in my sleep. Um, I dressed um, the... Uh, but did you have a baby reindeer I toy? I had a toy reindeer. So that's true. And he shaved his head. That bit is true. Mm. And there were reindeers in the shops. It was Christmas time or something. It was a joke. So I have inadvertently penned the name of the show. Right. But that is true. That's true. That's that's true fact. So you you would say you only sent him a handful of emails. Yeah. You never texted him. No. You tweeted him 18 times, you think. You never sent a Facebook message. Oh, uh -huh. that's and right. And you wrote in one letter. Yeah. So why have they got all these details here which are supported? Who is they, Netflix? Who has sent all these correct. things? correct. So, I'm sorry? Who has sent all this stuff to him? I've no idea. I think he's probably made it up himself. I mean, you could prove, I guess, quite easily it wasn't you. Correct. Because it'd all be on your computer. Yeah, correct. Post. That's right. Would you be happy for someone to look at that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah. What, what do you have? What technology do you use? Right, what technology do I use? A very, very old smartphone just now because the other one packed up a week before moving. That's it. Because they're all sent from an iPhone. Yes, yeah, so... But they believe it wasn't actually an iPhone ever being used. Meaning what Meaning kind that of someone phone? was hiding the fact that they were actually not using... It, it, they were pretending it was from an iPhone. I don't really understand that. Well, people can mask where they're sending stuff from. OK, uh, right, I'm not technology whiz kid of the year. I wasn't doing that either. 
I mean, obviously, when you make such an emphatic denial of the mm. central point of the story, mm. you're basically accusing both him but also Netflix of lying about it. I am. And that's, that's pretty defamatory. It's not defamatory if it's true. No, no, it's defamatory that they've been to oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I misunderstood there. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I don't see how anyone could do 41,000 emails and all this kind of stuff, you know. I don't know how much you know about technology, but are you aware that if it was you sending those emails, it would be very easy for the police, for example, to work out exactly where they come from? That the IP address yeah, would reveal yes, that. Yes, I understand that, and it stays on forever. But the point is, this was years and years ago. We were congratulating him. But, but it, would all it would all still be there. Uh, yes, yes, I understand that. Yeah. And if you sent 41,000 emails... This is all just a lot of rubbish. Yes, yeah, so that should be stored there. Well, they'd all be there. Yeah. I mean, he's got them. He's not got 41,000 emails. That's over a year. Well, according to you, how there's, only, there's only a handful. Take, yeah. Right? I mean, how long would that take someone to type up? How many do you think you sent him? A handful. But like, like that, what does that mean? How many? Uh, uh, less than 10. 10 emails. Not 41,000. Right, there's a massive disparity between the yeah, two. Yeah, things. I agree. I agree. I mean, uh, Chase, what do you got? So let's talk about barriers really quick. If you're ever at a restaurant with somebody and they've got a glass like this and it's over here and they pick it up, take a sip out of it, and then it gets placed here, that's the placement of an object between you. So always watch to see if somebody picks an object up and sticks it in between you. So if this on its own doesn't mean much, but you'll see other cues if something is off. Right at this moment, when they say, when he says, would you be happy for someone to look at that? Would you be happy for someone to take a look at that? We let's talk about the, we talk about behavioral clusters all the time. This is great. We have rising vocal pitch. We have a postural retreat. She's leaning away. There's repetition again. There's head shaking. No, this is relevant in this case because of baseline. She does yes and she does no. Both of those regularly. There's a dominant shoulder retreat. As far as I know, I've coined that phrase. Maybe not. But I tend to use this when the dominant shoulder goes back and away, somebody's experiencing a strong negative response to something. There's a loss of fluency after this. She's less fluent in her words, very suddenly and, and markedly. There's answer repetition. She repeats the answer. There's fading facts. Scott, you're probably going to tackle that. There's neck protection toward the end of this with the chin down movement here, moving her chin down. And when, when Pierce is talking about the iPhone issue, her blink rate goes sky high. We should not be seeing this behavior, especially if this information uh, that would make her angry or focused on the question. So if it, if it was true, uh, if she was innocent, that might piss her off. That might make her angry. Or she really wants to hear the whole question because she knows it's not true. Blink rate slows down at that point. So from the behavior we're seeing here, it definitely looks like there's more than 10 emails. And something tells me her confidence in saying it's not 41,000 emails means that she knows it's probably thousands, but her estimate in her head is far lower than 41K. The only time you see a confident statement here is when she makes the denial about the specific number of emails, which is interesting. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, and for the emails, I kind of tried to figure that out. I think it's going to be 38 emails a day for three years in a row. And that's going to come up to around 41, a little over 41,000, mm -hmm. I think. So that's a lot of, yeah, I mean, I haven't, I've never emailed anybody 38. I don't think I send 38 emails a day. It's really, that, so that, that's, she would, she would know that. I mean, she would know that's a really high number. So maybe, that maybe that's what that, that whole thing is about there. I mean, that's why she's kind of, um, I think she's, I think she's wondering, she's, she might be like, gosh, that is a lot for that many a day. Maybe it doesn't seem like that to her or something. I, I, can't, I can't figure out what the logic would be if you've sent 48 or 41,000 emails and then you say, no, you didn't, that guy's going to have your servers or whatever. They're going to be able to find out you sent 41,000 emails. There's no question about that. So that, that, I just thought that was, that was odd. But right out of the gate, when he asks her a yes or no question, she says, yeah. And, it, and that's sort of broken up as, and she, uh, she she comes back and forth pretty quick, and then she says, you know, yeah. And that's a lot of words for a yes or no question. She keeps going. There's, there's a lot of uh, 
things that are starting to show us a lot more, like you were saying, Chase, cues of deception in here. We're seeing clusters of things that, that happen. And that's a big one at this point. Then her face goes blank. So I thought that was odd, too, which I think goes back to y'all's ASD um, suggestions there. Because we see when we see this thing where she's given an expression that her face goes blank, we're going to see that throughout this entire interview. So watch for that because she goes from a, from a smile and or, or concern or anger and then down to this blank expression. She'll go from laughing to a blank expression. Not every time, but watch for it because it's there. And then this is where the moaning starts. After he says emphatic denial, that's when she goes, uh, I think this is a self-soothing thing for that personality type maybe as well. Because we hear that show up over and over and over as the stress increases. Because at the first, there wasn't a whole lot because she was just getting started. There was some because it was stressful. You guys know how it is when you go on TV and they go, okay, two. And they point and you're like, that's, I think, I, that's what's made her stress go up at the beginning. And then Piers is so relaxed, she's kind of, you know, that's that kind of leaks over into you, whoever you're talking to. If they're nervous, you're going to be nervous. So I think she's sort of got settled down there and it goes away, but it's starting to show up here again as the stress increases. Um, all right, I'll leave it there. Greg, what do you got? If I were interrogating this woman and writing an intelligence report, I would caveat the hell out of the report with rational, th irrational thinking, not reliable information, all that. I mean, just because it is so erratic and it is so broken. I worked with a woman who had a serious brain injury from a car accident once, and she could never finish an entire thought, an entire sentence. She was compartmentalized in all of her sentences until she got angry. And then she would have only that one track that she would go at. And there's a lot of that kind of thing going on here for me. Just pay attention. I'm going to walk through those in a second. But let me also give you a great free tool. Chase, you brought up a water glass. I love that water glass with the finger out and all that. But watch the water tremble. Once when I was a kid, I read in Ripley's Believe It or Not, the first Lie detector was put your finger in a pan of water and watch for the ripples. <laughs> watch the water ripple as she holds her hand and then watch her obsess on setting it back down. That's a good indicator of stress. You can use that when somebody's on the witness stand. You're doing depositions. You can see stress then. That's fight or flight coming and going. And it causes our bodies to do a lot of stuff. Um, when she does that, Scott, she does a couple of times. She says, uh-huh, to answer something that's true. And then she does a yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that one. She breaks, once she says that, when she says, yeah, she breaks eye contact down. And then she's got that distaste in her mouth as she does that, internalizes the thoughts and looks down. Right. She repeats that question about technology. Exactly what kind of technology do you have? What kind of technology do I have? That's a distancing tool, a chance to allow her to think, whatever. And then she goes to, I have one phone. The other one's packed up. Okay, which of us, packs our phone and goes to our backup phone so we can move. That's too much information. That's insulating again. And then she's got a toothy smile suddenly. I think that's her conflict face, Chase, you brought up. When she's ready for conflict, you could see that. These are erratic patterns. It just looks really awkward. And then we get to see a part of the reason why. She's got an underlying, an underlying story of defense that she's created, and we see it creep through. She says, that was years ago, and we were all congratulating him on the show. She's giving you an excuse she's making for these emails right out loud, right there. The reason I did it is because of that. Well, that has nothing to do with what he's asking, but she came there prepared to say it, so she's going to say it. That's another irrational indicator, another reason why I would not trust intelligence collected from her. And then finally, one of the best examples of how you would use bracketing is right here. Elicitation and bracketing. I'm sitting at a bar. Was it 10 or was it 41,000? Those are two very ridiculous extremes. When she says, well, it wasn't 41,000. Okay, then how many was it? 38,000? No, no, it was more like, and then you go low. Okay, was it nine? You start bracketing and you close in. And what happens is a person starts to feel irrational with how outlandish the differences are. And she is. Then you can see her starting to go boom, boom. One of the other things that we have to pay attention to is, of course, if she was a stalker, not saying she was, stalkers have no idea how many emails they're sending, how often they're coming to your house. That's part of the whole underlying problem. They don't understand what's normal or rational and expectable. So they do things that are outside those parameters. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, exactly. What kind of person, what kind of personality, what kind of character would you have to have who can be so logical at times and then so irrational in the next moment, who, as we've all said, is, is having some quite extreme 
behaviors that for some neurotypes that we might know wouldn't be so extreme. We might have all of us come across them, uh, you know, now and again. So what are we dealing with here? We're certainly dealing with a, a type that we don't deal with a great deal on this show. I think maybe maybe two or three examples maximum, I would I would think. Um, look, it's not the it's not she's not disputing that it's her that's the genesis of this show. That's not in dispute. She's already said, you know, I, I came up with baby reindeer. So she's she's absolutely linked herself. That's not in dispute. What's in dispute here is how much of the truth of it is factually accurate. That's that's the issue for for her. And she is rational enough to understand that. But then when given some of the facts, the indisputable facts, it becomes quite irrational. That's an extreme behavior that we don't come across a great deal. Now, the, the great thing about this and why this is so popular at the moment is entertainment is the business of extremes. That's, that's what entertainment does. It provides you with extremes because you don't want to see your daily life right in front of you. You, you know, our lives are particularly boring. You know, if, we, if the whole of my day, you know, there are moments in it which are slightly extreme, hopefully not too many moments, but maybe once a year or something quite extreme happens. But if extremes were happening, you know, 24 frames a second, then I just wouldn't be able to manage that. And that would be a film. That would be, that would be a Netflix show. And so we've got extreme behavior happening here and, and, and you've got extreme behavior happening in the Netflix show. Let me just tell you a little thing about uh, about the, the hospital uh, called uh, um, uh, St. Mary of Bethlehem in London, Bedlam, it became known as. And you could pay money in the 1700s to show up there, you know, fine, ladies and gentlemen, that we would be to, to watch um, people who had mental conditions usually get hosed down with with very cold water, naked. And that was entertainment. That was entertainment to see people with mental conditions in front of you kind of get hosed so that they would ramp up their extreme behavior. I'm not saying this person has a mental condition. I'm not saying that's what we're seeing. But it feels to me sometimes very, very close. It seems very, very close. And in, and in one aspect of it, uh, it was encased in, you know, this is a Netflix show, and so it's safe for you to watch, though my understanding is there's some very extreme drama in that show. And in this case here, yes, she has come by her own volition. She has signed up for it and says, hey, Pierce, I'll have an interview on that. But we've got to wonder, is she in the kind of state that she should be allowed to do that. And, and, you know, that's a, that I don't have the answer to that. That's a bit of a debate as to who should be allowed feel, uh, who, who we should decide is too vulnerable to be in this kind of situation. Anyway, feels to me like maybe a little of a hosing of a naked woman with, with, with ice cold water might be going on here. So you, you would say you only sent him a handful of emails. Yeah. You never texted him. No. You tweeted him 18 times, you think. You never sent a Facebook message. Oh, uh -huh. that's and right. And you wrote in one letter. Yeah. So why have they got all these details here which are supported? Who is they, Netflix? Who has sent all these correct. things? So, I'm sorry? Who has sent all this stuff to him? I've no idea. I think he's probably made it up himself. I mean, you could prove, I guess, quite easily it wasn't you. Correct. Because it'd all be on your computer. Yeah, correct. Press. That's right. Would you be happy for someone to look at that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah. What, what do you have? What technology do you use? Right, what technology do I use? A very, very old smartphone just now because the other one packed up a week before moving. That's it. Because they're all sent from an iPhone. Yes, yeah, so... But they believe it wasn't actually an iPhone ever being used. Meaning what Meaning kind that of someone phone? was hiding the fact that they were actually not using... <laughs> it, they, they were pretending it was from an iPhone. I don't really understand that. Well, people can mask where they're sending stuff from. OK, uh, right, I'm not technology whiz kid of the year. I wasn't doing that either. I mean, obviously, when you make such an emphatic denial of the mm. central point of the story, mm. you're basically accusing both him but also Netflix of lying about it. I am. And that's, that's pretty defamatory. It's not defamatory if it's true. No, no, it's defamatory that they've been to oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I misunderstood there. Yes, exactly. 
Exactly. I don't see how anyone could do 41,000 emails and all this kind of stuff, you know. I don't know how much you know about technology, but are you aware that if it was you sending those emails, it would be very easy for the police, for example, to work out exactly where they come from? That the IP address yeah, would reveal yes, that. Yes, I understand that, and it stays on forever. But the point is, this was years and years ago. We were congratulating him. But, but it, would all st- it would all still be there. Uh, yes, yes, I understand that. Yeah. And if you sent 41,000 emails... This is all- just a lot of rubbish. Yes, yeah, so that should be stored there. Well, they'd all be there. Yeah. I mean, he's got them. He's not got 41,000 emails. That's over a year. Well, according to you, how there's, only, there's only a handful. Yeah. Right? I mean, how long would that take someone to type up? How many do you think you sent him? A handful. But like, like that, what does that mean? How many? Uh, uh, less than 10. 10 emails? Not 41,000. Right, there's a massive disparity between the yeah, two. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I mean... Did you ever contact Richard Gadd's parents and no, threaten them? No, that allegation was put to me by journalists, no. Never happened? No. There's one key point in the mm. drama no. that uh, it has Martha's character pleading guilty to intimidating Richard Gadd in court and sentenced to nine months prison time. Uh, let's watch. You are charged with the stalking of Mr. Donald Dunn between the dates of the 14th of August 2015 and the 22nd of March 2017. Are you guilty or not guilty? Guilty. <laughs> you are charged with the harassment of Gerald Dunn and Eleanor Dunn between the dates of the 6th of June 2016 and the 22nd of March 2017. Are you guilty or not guilty? Guilty? <laughs> well, it'll read here. Now, again, there is a, obviously a resemblance between... Do you think so? Well, well, a bit, but <laughs> That's only <only> flattery. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean to flatter you or not flatter you. I just think there is a resemblance, you know, having met you and you both speaks you know, Scottish people. Yeah. Um, but the fundamental point of this is, mm. did you did you d- take part in that? Did you go to jail? Did you have no, a trial? No, of course not. Of course not. Have you ever been to prison? No. Have no. you ever been charged with no, any criminal either. offence? No. Never? No. Nothing? Nothing. So that scene is completely invented? That's completely false. And I don't think the actress sounds like me. I mean, people compare me to Lorraine Kelly, but I look nothing like Lorraine Kelly. We all happen to have dark hair and we're Scottish, mm. you know. I think the actress is from Glasgow, I think, but I'm not sure. But I'm they... And which part of Scotland are you from? I'm from the Central Belt. Um, the so a, a slightly different accent? A, a, it's slightly different. A Scot would know the difference. A Scot would know the difference. A Glasgow accent is very different. But that's a fundamental... Oh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is on the question of jail and she's watching the playback of some of the drama, which she says she's never um, watched before. I think given some of the information she's leaked... She must have watched some of it. I don't know whether she's watched this amount of it. Given her type of personality, if she started watching some of it, my guess is, is she'd probably complete it. But but I don't know. I don't know the truth around that anyway, or, or, the, or the factual truth, in fact. Seems like her eyes go up and around in a way, and I'd love other people's opinion on this, to, to kind of check the facts and the dates. Um almost like she's trying to work out her relationship with those facts and the, or with those dates that are put forward in the dramatization. Um, she seems unsure maybe of whether she is a part of that or not. So, but having said that, there's really good, clear, direct answers to the jail question. Have you, have you been to jail? Have you, that's really good and clear. I think those are good, seem very, very honest to me. And if we put that together with, Uh, the writer of the show, saying that he never wanted for her to go to jail. So my understanding is he never prosecuted on this. There seems a convergence here of it's very possible she didn't go to jail. But then why does she seem so unsure around checking that that data? Um, So for anybody who may suffer from delusions, may at times in their life uh, feel or be completely unhinged at times with reality, when you give them factual evidence and, in fact, performed in front of them a, a, an image that is an image of them uh, in a certain position and give them s- sure dates, 
it could be easy for them to get a little bit lost and wonder whether it was them or not and really need to think about that. Is that me? Am I connected with this? Because there could be, for her, things that she's doing, behaviours that she's doing, which would be extreme in our view, and we'd go, well, surely you remember that, and she may not remember that. And you may be able to present her with a dramatization, which at that point, because it's so um, uh, impactful, she may wonder whether she does have a relationship with it or not. And we, we've already decided that she definitely is the genesis of this character in this drama. So I think she's confused in this situation, potentially. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? I think what we're seeing with that eye movement is her trying to figure out do those dates line up? She never says she was not charged. Watch her when he asks, were you charged? And she massages her hand and she's buried. And it's she's got a blink rate that goes through the roof. She massages the back of her hand, followed by eye lock. And have you ever been charged? And if you watch the entire video, if you go back and watch the entire video, there's a place where she rambles about something, something to do with people don't often go to jail anymore. They get fines. She doesn't say she got a fine, she doesn't say anything else. But she's avoidant, and she massages your hand for the first time. He's funny because he's setting her up. He corrects himself that you both speak. He was going to say you both speak with a Scottish accent, but he did, and he said you both are Scottish people because he knows this actress is not Scottish, and he's setting her up. And he even sets her up to say a Scot should be able to tell that, right? So he's poking on her with this stuff. I think, it, you know— Pierce is pretty smart at knowing what it takes to get under somebody's skin. And I think he's doing a pretty good job of that at times here. Um, there's a couple of other things here. She wants that eye accessing, like I said there, we're going to see it again in another time when there's dates and she's trying to figure it out. She wants to edit what the, is going on during the video. If you watch her blink rate goes up, her finger rises. And there's that completely false. We got a really long vowel again that's out of place. It's not a Scottish long vowel. It's a elongated vowel. And I think that and that finger rise at the same time would make me want to ask her more questions. Well, what do you mean by completely false? Because you're qualifying false. It's either false or true. And I'd poke and prod just to see what I got. Doesn't mean there's anything, but it's a good indicator that her baseline deviation means something's going on in her head different than what was going on two seconds before. Now we see a masterful chap in redirect. She talks about this actor. She goes on how they don't look alike and walks away. That allows her to redirect her around away from the main thrust of this question about whether this happened or not. Who cares? Who cares if the actor looks like you? Who cares if she's from Scotland? But she does a fantastic chaff and redirect. By chaff and redirect, if you don't usually watch us, what I mean is aircraft drop chaff out the back of the plane so that missiles will follow those and allow them a chance to get away. Same thing a person does when they're chaffing and redirecting. Scott, what do you got? All right. After she says no, then we hear that little gasp again. Or not little gasp, we hear a big gasp again. And then it's followed by that blank stare. This is starting to become a pattern for her. Uh, it's actually becoming part of her baseline, I think, the way she answers questions. Because what's happening is, like in this case, I think she was going to say something else but changed her mind. So she's taking that gasp and she goes, mm, I think she's thinking and structuring what she's going to say. I mean, that, that's the only, I, I know we, we can't deal with logic in a lot of this, but that's the only thing I can, I can think of as, as why someone would do that. But I'm not so sure she'd actually be doing that, having just said that. I know it sounds weird, but it, it's, I don't know, this, this is an odd personality we're dealing with here, I think. So that's just my opinion. Uh, so we're, when she's watching the clip, as she's as if I said to any of you guys, hey, look, I made a little cartoon and I put each one of you in it. And Mark, you're up first here. You're going to be the first one to be talking to it. You don't think you'd go like this and scooch in and, and be watching it and paying attention to it and seeing what you look like or how I portrayed you in this in this cartoon. She shows no um, expressions of discovery on her face. Not like, oh, no eyebrows up, no nothing like this is new for her. So she she doesn't she doesn't do anything that that shows that this is um, almost a novelty to her. Like oh wow, look at there, there's me. You know somebody's doing me. None of that at all. And then um, after Pierce's statement about the similar look, she laughs real big and then, then drops back to a, a blank stare. So that's that's odd behavior when you can laugh and then go blank. That's that's odd. That's odd for, for what we used to see or known as normal people. Um, <clears throat> then we see a huge increase in, her, increase in her blink rate while she answers the prison question. Excuse me. 
Um, and then if full facial expressions are generated by emotion, then I don't think this woman is, is in my opinion, is emotionally stable because they're they're bouncing from one to the other. There's no no, no real morph from one to from one expression to the other in there. It's almost like when you're seeing Amber Heard go from crying to to normal. It's not that slow even. Amber Heard's were when she would change expressions, it was a lot slower than this, but there was no morphing in them. But in these, it's just like this and then this. You can literally watch her face just drop blank to to a blank expression really quickly. So I think there's a lot of pent up anger in here, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, I'm sure. Chase, what do you got? Let's talk about that gasp really quick. I agree with you all. But this happens right after Pierce says, never happened. That's what Pierce says. And I like to call this a nonverbal but. This is the body saying but because there's something else going on. And I think there is truth to this. And I think she's saying uh, what she's saying never happened didn't actually happen precisely as it was depicted. And I think that's the disagreement there. This was her body trying to be truthful here. And it's a beautiful example of a nonverbal but. So here's what's happening. We're seeing confidence in everything about not going to prison. Very confident. But when the questions start expanding in their scope from peers, we're seeing something change very quickly. She's more protective. She's eye blocking. The blink rate goes way back up again. And then there's another postural retreat backing away. I wish I could be asking some of these questions, but I'm not there to be able to peel this onion. None of us are. Uh, what I think we're seeing here is that she's mentally thinking of an interaction with police that she has had before. It might not have ended in full prosecution, but I think there's something her body's trying to suppress uh, when these questions start to expand in scope. Uh, might have been an investigation or a complaint that she's had to speak to police about before. Not sure, but that nonverbal but is huge and maybe one of the biggest, most perfectly illustrated examples I've ever seen. That's all I got. Did you ever contact Richard Gadd's parents and no, threaten them? No, that allegation was put to me by journalists, no. Never happened? No. There's one key point in the mm. drama no. that uh, has Martha's character pleading guilty to intimidating Richard Gadd in court and sentenced to nine months prison time. Uh, let's watch. You're charged with the stalking of Mr. Donald Dunn between the dates of the 14th of August 2015 and the 22nd of March 2017. Are you guilty or not guilty? Guilty. <laughs> you are charged with the harassment of Gerald Dunn and Eleanor Dunn between the dates of the 6th of June 2016 and the 22nd of March 2017. Are you guilty or not guilty? Guilty? <laughs> well, I'll read here. Now, again, there is a, obviously a resemblance between... Do you think so? Well, well, bit, <laughs> That's hardly flattery. Well, I, I don't mean to flatter you or not flatter you. I just think there is a resemblance, you know, having met you and you both speak you know, Scottish people. Yeah. Um, but the fundamental point of this is, mm. did you... Did you did, Take part in that scene. Did you go to jail? Did you have no, a trial? No, of course not. Of course not. Have you ever been to prison? No. Have you no. ever been charged with a criminal offence? No. Never? No. Nothing? Nothing. So that scene is completely invented. That's completely false. And I don't think the actress sounds like me. I mean, people compare me to Lorraine Kelly, but I look nothing like Lorraine Kelly. We all happen to have dark hair and we're Scottish, mm. you know. I think the actress is from Glasgow, I think, but I'm not sure. But I'm they, from Glasgow. and which part of Scotland are you from? I'm from the Central Belt. Um, the so it's a, a slightly different accent. It, it, it's slightly different. A Scot would know the difference. A Scot would know the difference. A Glasgow accent's very different. But that's a fundamental... Let me ask you, the Sun reported an interview with mm. Laura Ray, mm. uh, who you've referenced, who accused mm. you of inappropriate behaviour whilst mm. you work with her. Now, yeah. the background to this is that you came into contact with the late Glasgow MP Jimmy Ray, who died aged 78 in 2013, and his sister wife, Laura, who was 62, when she was a former mm -hmm. Labour Party member. Um, Mrs Ray said that uh, she gave uh, Aberdeen University law graduate you. Mm. You did graduate from Aberdeen? Yes, yes. With a law degree? Oh. 
uh, a trainee role at the legal firm MacPhail Lawrence Partnership in 1997. Is that true? It was called L and L Lawrence. I think she forgets the name of her own firm. It was called L and L Lawrence. But, but that's all true. She gave you a trainee job. Uh, she lured me away from another firm. She headhunted me from another firm because she needed someone to do employment law. And I'm pretty good at employment law, so... She said that she had to sack you days later because mm. you were completely incapable of behaving yourself. I walked. Her staff were really, really rude to me. Um, most people, half the Labour Party, had been up there at one point or another and walked. Mm. She then said that mm. following you leaving, uh, obviously mm. very quickly, mm. that you then harassed her. Mm. Uh, you were then, then known as Fiona Muir, obviously, mm. as you said, Muir Harvey. Mm. Um, Mrs Ray said she was so frightened she issued mm. workers at her firm with personal alarms. Mm. Um, you were then served an interim interdict mm. to stop you from contacting the lawyer or her politician husband. Daily um, Record reported that. She messed up, I know, and I've still to speak to David about that, um, the author of that Daily Record article. Mm. She didn't. She messed up because I went into the Court of Session, the High Court in Edinburgh, mm. to get countrywide interdicts, uh, an interdict and an injunction in Scotland and England because I was going to move to London anyway. Um, she mucked up... Um, Sorry, you went into court to get them yourself? Yes, against there was who? no need against Laura Walker and Jimmy Ray. But she said one was served on you. Yeah, that's that's nonsense. An interim so check this interdict. out. Well, and again, that, there would be um, a public record of Yeah, that. absolutely. And You're what, saying that it was never served? Uh, what we think, she served the initial documents. and then oh, she did? She might, uh, no. Um, she, she served the initial documents mm. and then there was no hearing. She, uh, it wasn't minuted for a hearing. Mm. I said I would defend, but she mocked that up too. She didn't fill up a second initial document. She then didn't minute for a decree in absence. So there is no interim interdict in Scotland. Why, why would two people who have no contact with each other at all... Mm. Um, Laura Ray mm. and Richard Gadd, why would they both portray you as a very unpleasant harasser. I don't know why Richard Gatt has, but uh, Laura Walker, it was certainly because I was going for parliamentary selection. The two different, you get my point, two different people. Yeah, but Richard Gatt has Googled that. Richard Gatt, Gatt has used that as Well, that's in the drama, the show. Is, is when they find out mm. that you had previously uh -huh. harassed this family. I haven't harassed that family. I didn't harass that family. And also I worked for her in 1987-88. The parliamentary selection wasn't until 2000. He Googled up the article because I knew he'd done that. Mm. I never went back to the Holy Arms. He was spreading it around Camden that, that, um, that I was a stalker. Have so you, you, you're, You've never married? I know. All right, Greg, what do you got? This is a really good one to me because we get to see, I don't think this is a pattern of deception by intent. I think it's deception by evasion. And I think, Mark, you hit it dead on the head. There's going to be a great example that clarifies everything we're all saying about she's upset that the story is not 100% accurate. She's There may be facts in there, but those are not what she came here to talk about. She came here to talk about the entire story. So her there's a clear pattern of deception by evasion in her. And by that, I mean, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about this. It's not chaff and redirect. It's just outright either insulate, move, and move to the next topic or try to avoid or go mm, and move on to the next thing. All that moaning stuff that she does is really bizarre, but it's a personality trait. I've known people who do that kind of thing as well. It's just a little odd. There she is accessing those dates again. You see her head her eyes up moving around as she's accessing. What we can't tell you is that in her head exactly what she's thinking. What we can tell you is that dates have generated the same pattern of behavior twice, which to you, Mark, back to what you said earlier, likely means she's rationalizing whether those are the right dates or something different. There's a whole lot of erratic thinking, I would suggest, in the way she approaches everything that's asked. But one of my favorites is that mouth groom. And we associate mouth grooming with two things. In normal people, when your mouth gets really dry, you may do that. When you start to feel stress, you may do that. But it can become like every adapter, like every time a person does something, it can become a habit too. So we got to be careful. But it isn't a habit because you don't do it all the time. Just when you hit hot topics. When he starts to go into that list of charges, watch that, followed by a grimace. That's big. That's a big deviation from what we've seen to date. I'd spend a lot of time. I'd stop right there and I would do what I call a micro interview. I'd say, hold on. I don't care about anything else. Why is there so much consternation around this? And I would poke and prod to see what I got. There's the um, 
And here we are at a hard question again. So these elongated vowels mean something. If we go back and play nothing but the elongated vowels from this entire video, we would probably get to the crux of the matter and what's actually happening. And this is the first time she has directly answered a question when she's countering with, I walked, I walked. Every other time she's evaded and moved aside, kind of like those fan dancers in burlesque, moving things to hide so you have an illusion. In this case, she actually responds with a counter and says, they didn't fire me, I walked. And then she throws her chin up and there's some, as he starts talking about the changes in her name by taking Muir out, and this could play into legal accusations, her chin goes up in defiance. So then she goes into one of the stupidest things and one of the most irrational behaviors I've seen yet. She doesn't say, I didn't do anything that should have resulted in an injunction. What does she say? She screwed up the paperwork. She makes a big deal out of the fact she screwed up the paperwork. Another time we see the mouth grooming is when you ask her, so you've never been married. There it comes again. Those things mean something. We're seeing patterns. We're seeing erratic behavior and evasion. We're not seeing outright lying. We're seeing deception. And if it's not intentional, it's hellaciously good accident. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so totally agree on that. Head back. Uh, chin up. It, it's aloof. It's arrogant. Uh, it's certainly ag aggressive if it's none of those two things that I just mentioned. So she's getting more aggressive around this harassment uh, accusation. And just put it in context, this is harassment of uh, one or a, a couple who are, you know, going to be relatively high up in the Labour Party within Scotland. So Labour Party is the, at that point in history, the opposition uh, party. Uh, political party. So she is affiliating herself with people who, with some status in uh, one of the three main political parties, arguably, in the UK. So she's connecting with high status Labour Party society, who then become inept. Then suddenly, they're just unable to do anything uh, properly. And they become jealous of her as well. So how do, how do you go from these are great people who I'd want to work with and they're high up in the Labour Party too, they are the biggest idiots ever who are jealous of me. This flip-flop from positive to negative. Look, I, I don't know exactly what that would be about, but some people might associate that with, as you were suggesting, Greg, borderline personality disorder, where you can go from idealization to uh, devaluation really quickly, or from adoration to hostility very, very quickly, um, you know, within within the turn of a, a, a coin or over time, but it's this extreme. You may know people who you're going, well, how come they said they were such great people that they were working with at the start of the relationship? And we're like two weeks in and now they're crooks and like they're the worst people ever and they're out to get everybody. Th those things can't be true at the same time. How is this so misjudged? Or how are you able to see the world in such a binary set of extremes? Well, there are personality types that can see the world in these binary extremes, and they can happen quite quickly, and we may not see them. It may not be fact to us, or it may not be the truth to us, but it is certainly observable fact to them and observable truth uh, to them. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Uh, Scott, what do you got? Yeah, right out of the gate, she starts that moan again. And I, I, I'm going to go back and say, I think it's self-soothing. I think she's doing that that for her. Mm -hmm. And then it's because it's repetitive, it's loud, it's clear, it's clean. And I'm not even so sure she knows she's doing it. I think she's done it so often, it just starts coming out. And then when she says Labor Party member, like you're talking about, Mark, she winces. She purses her lips, she squints her eyes, and she opens her mouth and, and shows her teeth during that. So I don't think she either likes the lady he's talking about or that party or both. I'm not not. Do you know which one she's in, Mark? Or how do you know that? Uh, she, well, she she wanted to be elected as as um, Labour Party candidate. She wanted to be the candidate oh, for Parliament. Okay, um, well, it makes yeah. sense. Then. I mean, yeah, yeah. So okay. she would be pro Labour, but uh, but she is showing, as you say, kind of Angry. disgust and disdain, and you know, yeah. where's the logic in that? Well, there maybe yeah. is. Maybe they didn't accept her. <laughs> Maybe that's what got, got her. Oh, they certainly didn't accept her. No. Yeah. But she says so they, they were angry, jealous yeah. of her. 
Yeah. So I'm sure maybe maybe that's what it is. So I think the oddest thing we've seen so far is when she's listening and starts moaning and that blink rate goes through the roof. And then her head leans back real far again and that chin juts out. I think it's just good old fashioned weird we're seeing here. Just weird, odd behavior. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it's weird. And this It's almost like she's trying to sing while Pierce is talking, like just humming mm-hmm. into the mic. And here's how I personally spot when somebody might be delusional. Number one, a reasonable action is mentioned that took place that someone didn't like, something somebody didn't like. And second, the response to that it is nonsensical, irrational, difficult to connect to the reasonable action. Difficult to connect to the reasonable action. Go watch the Johnny Depp trial uh, if you want to see a whole lot of that stuff. So here we're seeing her deny that the restraining order was served. Then it was. Then she messed it up. Then she was going to file the same thing. Uh, so the Wow. Hmm. Brilliant. There. Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're back. Yeah. You were just finishing up on Johnny Depp, I think. Yeah. yeah. Just right yeah. In. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Well, <laughs> give, give, give us the highlights at least. They, we hear a great one here. Why did Richard describe you as unpleasant? And she said, I don't know why. People who are innocent of these things, who are accused of this, tend to think about that stuff a lot. If somebody accused you of that and it was public, you'd think about why the hell that happened. You'd have a lot of ideas. They'll be able to speculate about it nonstop. So there's a chance this clip fits my criteria for delusion. Uh, Not only that, it does it three times in a row, which I thought was interesting. Let's have another. Mm. Okay. Well, gosh, that was close, man. Chase, the expression. I'm going to have to give it to Chase. Sorry, Mark. Um, He meant it. Let me ask you, the Sun reported an interview with Mm. Laura Ray, Mm. uh, who you've referenced, who accused Mm. you of inappropriate behaviour whilst Mm. you work with her. Now, the background to this is that you came into contact with the late Glasgow MP Jimmy Ray, who died aged 78 in 2013, and his sister wife, Laura, who was 62, when she was a former Mm -hmm. Labour Party member. Um, Mrs. Ray said that uh, she gave uh, Aberdeen University law graduate you. Mm. You did graduate from Aberdeen? Yes, yes. With a law degree. Uh, a trainee role at the legal firm MacPhail Lawrence Partnership in 1997. Is that true? It was called L and L Lawrence. I think she forgets the name of her own firm. It was called L and L Lawrence. But, but that's all true. She gave you a trainee job. Uh, she lured me away from another firm. She headhunted me from another firm because she needed someone to do employment law. And I'm pretty good at employment law, so... She said that she had to sack you days later because Mm. you were completely incapable of behaving yourself. I walked. Her staff were really, really rude to me. Um, Most people, half the Labour Party, had been up there at one point or another and walked. Mm. She then said that Mm. following you leaving, uh, obviously Mm. very quickly, Mm. that you then harassed her. Mm. Uh, you were then, then known as Fiona Muir, obviously, mm. as you said, Muir Harvey. Mm. Um, Mrs. Ray said she was so frightened she issued mm. workers at her firm with personal alarms. Mm. Um, you were then served an interim interdict mm. to stop you from contacting the lawyer or her politician husband. Daily um, Record reported she that. She messed up, I know, and I've still to speak to David about that, um, the author of that Daily Record article. Mm. She didn't. She messed up because I went into the court of session, the High Court in Edinburgh, mm. to get countrywide interdicts, uh, an interdict and an injunction in Scotland and England because I was going to move to London anyway. Um, she mucked up. Um, so you went into court to get them yourself? Yes, against there was who? no need against Laura Walker and Jimmy Ray. But she said one was served on you. Yeah, that's that's nonsense. An interim so check this interdict. out. And well, again, that there would be a public um, record. Of yeah, that. absolutely. And you're what, saying that it was never served. Uh, what we think, she served the initial documents, and then oh, she, did. she might uh, no. 
um, she she served the initial document mm. and then there was no hearing. She uh, It wasn't minuted for a hearing. Mm. I said I would defend, but she mocked that up too. She didn't fill up a second initial document. She then didn't minute for a decree in absence. So there is no interim interdict in Scotland. Why, why would two people who have no contact with each other at all... Mm. Um, Laura Ray mm. and Richard Gadd. Why would they both portray you as a very unpleasant harasser? I don't know why Richard Gadd has, but uh, Laura Walker, it was certainly because I was going for parliamentary selection. The two different, you get my point, two different people. Yeah, but Richard Gadd has Googled that. Richard Gadd, Gadd has used that as Well, that's in the drama, the show. Is, is when they find out mm. that you had previously huh. harassed this family. I haven't harassed that family. I didn't harass that family. And also I worked for her in 1987-88. The parliamentary selection wasn't until 2000. He Googled up the article because I knew he'd done that. Mm. I never went back to the Holy Arms. He was spreading it around Camden that, that, um, that I was a stalker. Have so you, you, you're, You've never married? I know. You know, here's the thing. I don't know the truth. Mm. You do. Mm. And you've been emphatic in yeah. the number of denials you're yeah. making here. That's right. But many of those things that I've put to you can be proven. You're talking about emails and an email trail thing. All that. You know, all of that. You're obsessed with... Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be horrible. I'm not obsessed you. with anything. You're, you, you've gone on at length for a good 10 minutes about the emails. Well, only because yeah. the emails... Because the so, last number. Well, mm. there's a huge number and voice messages... The voice messages he's kept apparently, mm. and it and there is maybe taping me in the Holy Arms. I don't know if he's got any voicemail. But if he has three hundred and fifty voice messages and it's you, it doesn't mean the drama is true. Um, but is it possible he's got three hundred and fifty voice? Messages? I doubt that very much. I just don't think so. You doubt it? Yeah, I, I doubt it. I mean, unless wouldn't he's been you be, taping me? I mean, if you've never really contacted him. If he's he got could have three, been taping me in the Holy Arms, though. But if he's got 350... I've got no, If these are on his phone... Yeah, it doesn't matter what whether they're on a phone, tablet, whatever they're on, I've not coincided But I'm curious, him. why would there even be a possibility of him having that number of voice messages from you? Because he's crazy, he wants to make this up. I mean, I've not phoned the guy. I don't have his number. Yeah, but you're you're not sure that he hasn't got those? I think he... The only explanation for having a voicemail from me would be um, taping me in the Holy Arms. That's the only place... Or that you've mix. left messages on his phone. That's the other explanation, which just didn't happen. But you can't be sure? I can't be sure because I didn't have his number. Right, but you just said you weren't sure if these were your voice messages. <laughs> yeah, what I mean is somebody could be taping me, you know, somebody could have taped me in the holy arms. Right, but, on a dictaphone or something but if like he, that. My, here's my point to you, is yeah. that these are easily provable things. Yeah. He's either got them or he hasn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, and the emails, we'll be asking for disclosure of that. But and the emails, obviously, mm -hmm. there'll be an IP address and that if, that, yeah. if that, mean, that leads to you. Yeah, I mean, my point is, though, even if that were true, mm. I didn't lunge at him across the bar, I didn't sexually assault him in a canal, I didn't go to jail. I understand. So, but here's, uh, here's my point to you. Yeah. Here's my point to you. All right, Mark, what do you get? Yeah, important. So she's, she's given evidence around the electronic evidence and she says it doesn't mean the drama is true which is you know that's accurate doesn't mean the drama is true so there's a big difference between fact and truth and drama and and she's in all kinds of places at all kinds of times now uh, with delusional disorders the more you investigate, the more it starts to fall to bits as a good general rule. And so there may have been some elements of, of, of this, or, the, or let's just say there may be some elements when you're talking to somebody with a delusional disorder that at the start, it's, it's quite good. It all seems to work, but the more you get into it, the more it's going to fall to bits. And I think that's what we're seeing as we get uh, taping me in the Hawley Arms. Taping me, may have been taping me in the Hawley Arms. Well, that's potentially fantasy, and it's certainly paranoia. So now we've got fantasies, paranoia, and it's very difficult for her to understand the other side of this story or, or, or potential other ways that this might have come about, uh, why there might be this electronic evidence. She's not open to hearing those other ideas, and she comes back again with paranoia and fantasy. I can think of many of examples where people might feel there is a sense of delusion going on. 
Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. She opens up with the loudest gasp we've heard so far because I think she feels threatened at this point because he's turned the heat up a little bit on her. And after uh, he says the voice messages uh, he's kept apparently. Then she makes the biggest expression of disgust I think I may, may have ever seen. It's huge. So she's, she doesn't want to have any of that. She's looking at that like, no, no, keep that away from me. And th this is important because he says, if he has 350 voice messages and it's you, and like you were saying, Mark, it, she says it doesn't mean the drama is true. There's a lot there that she's telling herself, basically. Um, so anyway, she's contradicting herself because she says that doesn't exist. But then she talked about how um, she had deleted, I think, earlier voicemails. Or she had listened to earlier voicemails. Yeah, she should say no. That there are none. There are. Let me let me stop you right here. There are no voicemails on there. There won't be one. He won't have any of them. But she can't say that. So this is actually classic stalker behavior, because what she's doing is she's trying to blame him, and not taking the blame any of the blame herself. That that she's being that he's being stalked. She's saying, oh, that's his fault. Everything's his fault. And that, that's what they do. That's how, and that's like your, to your point earlier, Mark, about how she doesn't realize she's doing some of these things. She doesn't realize she, maybe she, that's, that's what she's doing. You know, maybe she just thinks she's trying to connect with him or something. She's just sending all these emails and voicemails and stuff. Um, then he says, if the voicemails, um, let's see if there are voicemails. And she says, if there are, are voicemails, it didn't mean all the other stuff existed, in other words. So I, I, it's hard to go through this because I'm under the impression she's she's not being honest here. I could be wrong, just my opinion. That's right. That's where I'm. That's probably why I was going so fast through this. Is it look, it's looking like because I don't I don't believe a word she's saying. Chase, what do you got? She's an attorney and isn't cluing in to the fact that Pierce keeps coming back to the precise instances which can be. Proven, disproven, or demonstrated conclusively. And she seems not to fully understand that those details are more important than the conjecture. There's a full absence of denial about the voicemails and almost admits that, yeah, or admits that they could exist, give or take. She's saying that doesn't mean the drama is true, just like you said, Scott. And then she says, I doubt that very much. Man. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not buying it. And one of the reasons Pierce's question triggered this massive revelation in behavior is that he used a variation of what's called a bait question. And it's sometimes also called a mind virus. So when somebody who's guilty hears the words, is there any reason? The brain goes into overdrive trying to calculate unknowable things. And this is why the answer was so obviously deceptive. So when good questions come out, usually the behavior is amplified to make it easier to spot. And she says, I didn't have his number at the end of this. She's already talked about texting him at the beginning of this. But saying I didn't have his number. I thought that was interesting. That's all I got. Greg? Greg? So a rational actor, a person who is on stable footing and who is jilted or something happens to them, is liable to still behave badly because we're emotional. We're emotional creatures. But this is more like the country song where the woman's beating the guy's truck up because he jilted or that kind of thing. This is one of those things where you think this is irrational behavior in response to, OK, yes, maybe something happened and what she is. But she has an axe to grind is clear. And Mark, we, you said it earlier, but the the very thing here that she does when he says, what if he has 350 voicemails and it's you? She doesn't say it isn't. She says it doesn't mean the drama was true. We all said that, but she also eye blocks and mills her hands. This is a core story she came here to tell. I've been wrong. So whatever else happened can't be true. Whatever else happened can't be true. Now, a normal person, an average normal person, Chase, if I, if I got you in there and started assaulting you that way, say, stop just a second. Look, here's what happened. We went through this. We split up. I may have left him seven or eight messages. I may have sent two emails. I may have called whatever. A person who needs approval desperately and who needs that bond, that connection, is going to do everything possible not to get disapproved of right here. So this is a, an opportunity for this person to try to get approval from peers rather than being rejected 
And it, otherwise, she might be able to say, hold on, stop, stop. But she's not going to. So she goes out of her way and she does exactly what I've seen people who plug into your receptors do. Try to make you happy at every turn by using obfuscating or vague words rather than calling out where the problem is. We haven't heard many denials from her in this entire thing. We're six videos in, but we've heard a lot of of, of sidestepping the question, a lot of some kind of nebulous wording that doesn't have clarity. And when he goes after her about those voicemails, watch her fingers retreat into her hands. Chase, you always talk about digital flexion. This is like a cat hiding its claws or getting my, my feet out of the out of the driveway. This is she knows something's coming and she pulls back. She did. She's not arguing at all. I think this is the best indicator. We saw no video, but this one, we would say she probably did a whole bunch of this stuff. It might not be 100 percent true, but the other stuff that she's not talking about that she's so aggravated about in this clip will come up later. This is just clear that her axe to grind is in that one sentence and the rest of this stuff could be 100 percent true. We, we're not sure. That's all I got. You know, here's the thing. I don't know the truth. Mm. You do. Mm. And you've been emphatic in yeah. the number of denials you're yeah. making here. That's right. But many of those things that I've put to you can be proven. You're talking about emails and an email trail thing. All that. You know, all of that. You're obsessed with... Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be horrible. I'm not obsessed you. with anything. You're, 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 you've gone on at length for a good 10 minutes about the emails. Well, only because yeah. the emails... Because it's so, a vast number. Well, mm. there's a huge number and voice messages... The voice messages he's kept apparently, mm. and it and there is maybe taping me in the holy arms. I don't know if he's got any voicemail. But if he has three hundred and fifty voice messages and it's you, it doesn't mean the drama is true. Um, but is it possible he's got three hundred and fifty voice messages? I doubt that very much. I just don't think so. You doubt it? Yeah, I, I doubt it. I mean, unless but wouldn't he's been you be taping me? I mean, if you've never really contacted him. If he's he got could have three, been taping me in the Holy Arms, though. But if he's got 350... I've got coins. Yeah, but if these are on his phone... Yeah, it doesn't matter what whether they're on a phone, tablet, whatever they're on. I've not coincided. But I'm curious, him. why would there even be a possibility of him having that number of voice messages from you? Because he's crazy, he wants to make this up. I mean, I've not phoned the guy. I don't have his number. Yeah, but you're you're not sure that he hasn't got those? I think he. the only explanation for having a voicemail from me would be um, taping me in the Holy Arms. That's the only place... Or that you've met. left messages on his phone. That's the other explanation, which just didn't happen. But you can't be sure? I can be sure because I didn't have his number. Right, but you just said you weren't sure if these were your voice messages. <laughs> yeah, what I mean is somebody could be taping me, you know, somebody could have taped me in the holy arms. Right, but, on a dictaphone or something but if like he, that. My, here's my point to you, is yeah. that these are easily provable things. Yeah. He's either got them or he hasn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we, and the emails, we'll be asking for disclosure of that. But and the emails, obviously, mm -hmm. there'll be an IP address. And that if that, yeah. if that mean, leads to you. Yeah. I mean, my point is, though, even if that were true, mm. I didn't lunge at him across the bar. I didn't sexually assault him in a canal. I didn't go to jail. I understand. So, but here's, uh, here's my point to you. Yeah. Here's my point to you. And I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm not trying to trap you. I'm genuinely fascinated by this story. I watched the drama. I saw them declare it at the start as a true story. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the interviews since with all various people. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly a very complex situation, this. But unless I'm mishearing you, I think what you're saying is there is a possibility that you send a lot of emails. No, and there's a lot of no voice I, I didn't see that. But that it doesn't mean that you did the more serious things. Yeah, I am not saying at all that I sent loads of emails. Um, you maybe misheard, play back the interview. What I'm saying is a handful at most. If mm. if I did, congratulations about the show. But if he does have 350 voice messages... I know that he doesn't. And it's your voice. He doesn't. And everyone can now hear your voice. Unless he was taping me in the holy arms. Or, or he just kept them on his phone. I didn't phone him. Hmm. Mm. You sound unconvinced, but no, I'm no, not I'm not. I'm, honestly, I mean, what? No. So, is, is your point that you are you challenging him to reveal this evidence? No, I, I just would, I would challenge him to leave me alone. Because you're calling him a liar, and you're calling Netflix accomplice. I didn't use lies. those words. I said the the, the story and um, the play, the the mm. Netflix show is not true. No, but if they say that you sent forty one thousand emails, well, they, they are voice completely messages, wrong. All seven hundred forty four. They're tweets. completely wrong. So they are lying? They are lying. Yes, OK, yeah, in effect, he is lying and they are lying. And in order for a dramatisation to be true, mm. 
it's got to be, you know, the only defences are Veritas, I'm telling the truth, um, or um, the whole drama needs to be true. They have built it as a true story, so has he, and it's not. Mm. It's blatantly not. Even if the email thing was true, the rest is not. So Why what, would you qualify that, Fiona? Sorry, why would I what? Why would you suddenly qualify even if it's true about the emails? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. All right, I'll go first on this one. And I'm just going to focus on one thing, and I'm, I'm going to be short on this. Pierce does a fantastic job of severity softening on this. Quite often when you're dealing with an embezzler, you'll say, well, in other words, or you're dealing with a drug dealer, whatever the situation is in this situation, let's pretend it's an embezzler. You'd say, well, you know, the $1.2 million that's that's missing and and you compare it to their little, you know, $100,000, not little, that's a lot, to $100,000 or $10,000 it's missing. And you start comparing those two things together. And they're, then all of a sudden they pop up and go, wait a minute, man, it had nothing to do with $1.2 million or I don't have anything to do with a train load of drugs. All it was was a bag of whatever it was. And you get them to, to f feel more confident that they're not going to be as much trouble as they were before, you know, as, as they thought they were going to be. So um, in this case, he helps um, make her, what her crime, I guess, or whatever her negative st um, negativity about what's going on with her. I got to watch what I say on this. Is uh, doesn't sound as bad. So I think that's what he's doing there. I think he does a great job of it. And when she's asked about the 350 voicemails, her reaction is the same as every other answer we've seen here in, in a cluster of things she does. We see that it's super short. She turns away and she gives this micro expression of anger and disgust that's huge. And she's looking right down the barrel of the camera. It happens so fast. If you're not on it, you'll miss it. So when it comes back through and she's answering that question, take a look. Um, because if you saw this specific facial expression and it wasn't so quick like that, just it's just a snap, it would it would set your limbic system off. You'd be in 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 freeze fight or flight instantly because it's it's pretty scary looking. It's a micro expression, and I'm gonna call it a micro because it doesn't last long. It doesn't even last, I don't think it maybe a tenth of a second. That's what they usually that's the um part of the criteria that makes one up. But it, it is pretty hardcore. I think it's it's one of the biggest I've ever seen as far as an expression being a micro expression. So it's pretty big. Again, this makes me question her emotional stability. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this for me shows us how we can all get dragged into the delusion if there's enough uh, around us. Piers even says, well, you know, Netflix say it's a true story. Well, yeah, so does the Blair Witch Project. I mean, that's a standard thing for the start of anything that you're trying to do a show and go, it's a true story, because then the audience go, oh, it's a true story. That's even more, that's even better because it's a true story. Yeah, at the end, they say it's not a true story. It's based on that. So it's factually not going to be accurate. And that's the issue here. It's factually not accurate. Um, even if the email thing's true, she says, and he asks about that qualifier. He asks about that qualifier. Um, she should have said, even if the email thing were true. So there is this possibility that the email thing is true. Could it be that amount of emails? Well, as we were saying, Greg, you know, in corporate America, it's very easy to send hundreds of emails in a day. Could you send 34 a day for three years? Yes, absolutely you could, especially if they're very, very short and expletive and come one after the other after the other. And you may have been sent those kind of emails at some point. So you kind of know what I'm what I'm talking about, the kind of mindset that can happen whereby you can easily put out 34 emails uh, a day. And maybe you don't even know you did that because, because you're not quite attached to the way you feel and the way other people feel. And you're not attached to the consequence of that as well. You have no idea about the consequences of any of this. Anyway, she suppresses her lips uh, around all of that. Uh, her eyes flick around to try and find a solution. She says, what? Uh, to stall time on that. And she searches for something. Um, and she explains it away with being devil's advocate on that one. So look, she is, um, at times, we could feel like she's not attached to logic, and at other times, she's really attached to it. She's very sharp at some moments, and some of the behaviours at some points uh, beg belief. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? 
If you're watching this right now and you're still tuned in, put three emojis in the comments that describe this entire fiasco. How would you explain this in three emojis? I would like to see that. So this video, which for us is clip number seven, since we label them in Dropbox, this is the best clip of the entire interview. And I think it reveals what we probably have been wondering all along. And, and Pierce says, are you challenging him to reveal all this evidence? She says, no. She says, no. I'm asking him to leave me alone or challenging him. And I'm willing to bet he's not contacting her. This very sharp and immediate no, she says, is so powerful, I think that it reveals some truth about what's going on. I have no doubt this evidence will probably be released, maybe pretty soon it, with the stuff that's going on. And I have no doubt that it exists at this point. So to put a finishing touch on this, there's a perfect statement from Pierce. And he says what I would have said, and this is rare for me to say that for an interviewer. He says, you're calling them liars. So one of the things we know from tens of thousands of hours of research and experience with this is that when somebody's guilty, they'll have a very difficult time publicly calling someone a liar who's telling it how it is or close to how it is, uh, maybe in this case. Uh, even the email thing uh, might be true here. So this, this got me. Greg? We're on the same page, 100%. Here's the most interesting of the entire thing. He hits a nerve clearly when he says liar. The word liar, let's talk for a minute about barriers. Chase, you brought him up earlier. It may be I put something between us, that water glass she's doing constantly, that kind of thing. There's this adaptive mouth grooming thing. Again, that's a way of releasing nervous energy. And when I say sacred space, I mean a person is taking control of a space, putting something between you, and then doing an adapter, a way of releasing nervous energy and comforting self. And what they're in fact doing is creating a new reality on, on a psychological level. They now have control of their space, and they're making the unfamiliar familiar as they adapt. Because if you do the same thing all the time, that's a familiar thing. When he says that, watch your thumb start twiddling as she as he asks that question. That's a first for here. That's a lot of energy going for some reason. I love the fact he calls her on that qualifier. It is beautiful. It is one of the best I've ever seen. He also does one other very artful thing here. He stalls at emails only, so she only has to defend that so he can get her into a box and answer questions. He's already realized, I'm sure by now, that if I give her nine things to talk about, she's going to squeeze the balloon and go whichever way works best. This is a good example of locking a person down and putting them into a point and asking the question, Chase, agree with you 100%. She should have said, yeah, I want to see that. Prove it. That chin should have come up. It didn't. Yep. We see something very different. That's all I got. And I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm not trying to trap you. I'm genuinely fascinated by this story. I watched the drama. I saw them declare it at the start as a true story. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the interviews since with all various people. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly a very complex situation, this. But unless I'm mishearing you, I think what you're saying is there is a possibility that you send a lot of emails. No, and there's a lot of no, voice I, I didn't see that. But that it doesn't mean that you did the more serious things. Yeah, I am not saying at all that I sent loads of emails. Um, you maybe misheard, play back the interview. What I'm saying is a handful at most. If mm. if I did, congratulations about the show. But if he does have 350 voice messages... I know that he doesn't. And it's your voice. He doesn't. And everyone can now hear your voice. Unless he was taping me in the holy arms. Or, or he just kept them on his phone. I didn't phone him. Hmm. Mm. You sound unconvinced, but no, I'm no, not I'm not. I'm, honestly, I mean, what? No. So, is, is your point that you are you challenging him to reveal this evidence? No, I, I just would, I would challenge him to leave me alone. Because you're calling him a liar, and you're calling Netflix accomplice. I didn't use lies. those words. I said the the, the story and um, the play, the the mm. Netflix show is not true. No, but if they say that you sent forty one thousand emails, well, they, they are voice completely messages, wrong. All seven hundred forty four. They're tweets. completely wrong. So they are lying. They are lying. Yes, OK, yeah, in effect, he is lying and they are lying. And in order for a dramatisation to be true, mm. it's got to be, you know, the only defences are Veritas, 
I'm telling the truth, um, or um, the whole drama needs to be true. They have built it as a true story, so has he, and it's not. Mm. It's blatantly not. Even if the email thing was true, the rest is not. So Why what? would you qualify that, Fiona? Sorry, why would I what? Why would you suddenly qualify even if it's true about the emails? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. When Famous did you last, last have any contact with him? Famous last words. Years ago. Do you, years, do you remember years when? Years ago, no. Um, I, I left the Holy Arms, didn't go back, and he was calling me a stalker and things. And there were various things happening in the Holy Arms. You know, other women were warning me about them and everything, yeah. About him? About him and others with bad conduct. In, in relation to the 106 letters that he and Netflix say <laughs> you sent, well, here's my point. You've, yeah. you, you've admitted sending him one. Mm. And that presumably was a handwritten letter. Could could it be? Um, are, are you thinking I was maybe mistaken that I maybe did? No, forgotten. no, no. I'm just saying if if we accept that the one that you admit to mm. sending is in your own handwriting, mm -hmm. he has another hundred and five letters in your Pierce, that's handwriting. No sense. It's yeah, no sense. Are, are you prepared for him to show? That one. He's maybe forged things. I mean, people people forge a lot of things. You think he could, he's, he could successfully write a hundred and five letters to himself? Well, I certainly didn't. No, but you, you admit to sending one. My point is, if it turns out the other hundred and five are exactly the same handwriting, wouldn't that point? Yeah, to I mean, we'd obviously bring in handwriting experts. I didn't do it. No, you only, you only ever sent sorry. one letter. Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't sent that guy 106 letters. Do you still email people? It, what, what do you mean? Do you send emails? Yeah, yeah. Do you have the same email address you've always had? Um, I, I had six at one point. Why? Um, because I like to keep people on different phones and different emails. It's, six it's different easier. email accounts? Right? Uh, maybe four. I think it's four to six, yeah. It's, it's it four, easier. Four or it's six? easier. So you have some for your utilities, some mm. for close friends, whatever. Yeah. But six is a lot. Is it? I don't know anybody with six email addresses. You don't know many people then. I know, I know people with four or six emails right. addresses. Well, was it four or six? I can't remember. Probably six. Probably how, six. how many do you use today? I had four phones. Um, I've got one today, but I only email select friends. And you had you have four phones? Yeah. Um, two broke. They were very, very old. One was brand new and broke, and it's still to be returned to the shop. Mm. I like keeping people on separate phones as well. And maybe that makes me a maniac or a stalker or something. But if you've got somebody on about your electricity bill or somebody on about some work or something, it's, it's nice to keep it separate, you know. So um, I didn't do that in Scotland. You didn't have to, but the volume of calls... Do, do you down. think... All right, Chase, what do you got? I will admit that I've got two phones and I probably have five emails. Um, I don't think that's weird. But she's a lot more comfortable here when she's talking about getting handwriting experts to analyze these letters. A lot more comfortable. And I'm surprised. I also think she didn't send all of those letters. This is the first accusation that I've seen the highest amount of confidence in the denial for. And then the highest amount of confidence and comfort when the stuff was asked to be analyzed. Might be a bunch of letters, but she's very confident in that high number not being true. Scott, what do you got? All right. At the top, we're seeing frustration and anger, and her voice is loud, her cadence is fast, and her eyes are darting around, and her breathing's pretty heavy, and her torso moves this back and forth thing several times, so that's kind of odd. That lets us know her stress level's going up. Now, like what you're talking about, having, in a situation where you've got several different emails, that's one thing. You know, if you have uh, five or six, that's fine. I understand why you have them, Chase. You know, I think I have three but when you've got six eight different email addresses and you're not sure what they are, you know all yours, you know exactly what they are. And you're not sure of what they are. If I was to try to pull that off, my wife would be like this. Hey, I would accidentally send her one one day. That would happen. And she'd say, hey, who's Dr. Funkenstein 4409? It sounds like you wrote this. And it would be one I'd accidentally, you've got, you're really busy if you've got four phones and six email addresses. Two phones, it's no big deal. Everybody has, a lot of people have well, a job phone and a work phone and a, a normal phone, their phone. But when you start splitting people up for, for phones, you know, it, what do you, how do you do it? You know, it's okay, I'll, I'll keep uh, Greg and Jason and my wife and the dog uh, groomer on one phone, then I'll have to keep 
Mark and Chase on another phone because they're downstairs and they're not as good as being Greg because we're And then I've got who else on another? You, you've got you're splitting people up on your phone. That is ridiculous. That if it's at work and then normal, that's fine. But if you got four phones, something's up. That's she doesn't say was, it. It's work. She didn't separate them. No, she doesn't say no. She doesn't say that at all. She just says she has. She starts off with I have an old phone and that's it. I just just have an old phone. That's it. Now, uh, and then Pierce starts asking, starts giving that information about the, uh, it came from an iPhone. She pretends she doesn't know how all that works and everything. You know, I got a thousand bucks to say at least two of those four phones are iPhones, you know, she that, cause that's where she's, she's scooting, she's shooting those things out of that phone. That if what she's saying is true about having different people for different phones, I'm sure he's got his own phone. I'm sure she's got one just for him that she shoots all that stuff out on. You know, I think there's a, there's a whole lot going on in your life if you've got four phones and six emails and you're really busy keeping up with four phones and six emails. That's all you're going to be doing. That's all. I, I can't imagine that. That's all you'll be doing is keeping up with that and who's on. Them. So I, I think she's got all the stalking equipment she would ever need. She's got a great starter pack there for a, a stalking equipment since that's her the, the question is, is she the stalker? I don't know. I'm just, that's just my opinion. I'm just saying she has everything she needs to be one once she's got it. So, uh, Chase or Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I think she's got a hell of a stalker kit going there, right there. Pretty good, pretty good tools for doing it if that's what she's doing. More importantly to me is pay attention to just a handful of things. Remember, I talked about people needing approval. And, Mark, to your point, they it's the same person. They go when they need that approval. This person's fantastic. And when they don't get it, then they blow up and they're the worst people on earth. She still needs approval. Pay attention because Piers is stepping on her tripwire a couple of times here when he starts poking on it. She goes six because I want them. And then she reconsiders a six too many and says, well, it's four to six. And then she goes, no, it's four. She's trying to do a control release. When, I'm sorry, six. Then she goes four to six when she's talking about emails. Then without any provocation, she throws out the fact She's got four phones. Now, earlier, she had packed her phone to move and had a backup phone, but she's got four phones now. And those four phones, nobody asked. And what I see there is a controlled release. What she's doing is hedging so that later when something comes up, you say, well, I told you I had four phones. And she just let that pass. She was just going to throw it out, soft pedal it, and let it go. I think she can't take direct confrontation. When she gets to direct confrontation, Mark is when you see that other side. That nervous laughter, that crazy, boisterous, nervous laughter, when she says, I guess it makes me out to be a maniac, doesn't make you be a maniac, might be a symptom. Now we are starting to see under the tent. I said this in the very beginning. I think there's a lot of circus under this tent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I just reached into my desk down here. Here's my four phones. Okay, now, just so you know, three of these, they're just old phones. So that's why I have four phones is three of them are just old phones. So we'll put those uh, over there. And and they had, you know, I've moved the SIM card from one to the other to the other. So this one phone that I have has the same identity to it, uh, essentially. And all of my emails, I have several emails, they all move into one identity now. So why would I have just one phone and some other people might have more than one phone. I'm not judging anybody who has more than one phone. I'm just going to tell you the reasons why some people might have more than one phone. Well, and I'll tell you that by telling you why I get to have just one phone. I'm okay at managing my relationships. I, I can manage that with just one phone. All the relationships that I have, I can manage those just through one phone. I don't need anonymity. So uh, if you have my number, like, that's okay because I've got no problem with being anonymous. Um, I I am willing to pay the price and the consequences of my relationships. Like if I send you a text from this, you're going to know it's me. It's, a, it's the only one that I have. And if I say something that you don't like, I'm willing to pay the price of that. And I'm willing to bear the consequence of that, which might be me going, I don't care that it upset you. Or it might be me going, well, I'm really sorry that I did that, but I'm willing to deal with the consequences of that. Um, other people might not say that, but I'm relatively stable. So I can deal with just one phone. There's no massive instability in my life. 
Um, and I don't have, as far as I understand, disassociative uh, behaviors as well. I don't kind of feel like there are many versions of me. So, so I've got just one of these. So some of the reasons why other people might have more than one phone, <clears throat> certainly like four of them, may be the inability to deal with the severing of relationships or the having of relationships, the inability to deal with being known, wanting anonymity, not wishing to pay the price and the consequences of relationships wherever they go, uh, general instability, like which phone do I use? I don't know. I'm just unstable as to which one to use. And potentially disassociative behaviours, like one for every personality that I have. And that's why I have just one phone. Why she has four phones and six emails, I, I wouldn't want to speculate, but it could be some or maybe even potentially all of the reasons that I gave you there. That's all I got on that one. Famous when did you last, last have any contact with him? Famous last words. Years ago. Do you, years, do you remember years when? Years ago, no. Um, I, I left the Holy Arms, didn't go back, and he was calling me a stalker and things. There were various things happening in the Holy Arms. You know, other women were warning me about them and everything, yeah. About him? About him and others with bad conduct. In relation to the 106 letters that he and Netflix say <laughs> you sent, well, here's my point. You've, yeah. you, you've admitted sending him one. Mm. And that presumably was a handwritten letter. Could could it be? Um, are, are you thinking I was maybe mistaken that I maybe did? No, forgotten. no, no. I'm just saying if if we accept that the one that you admit to mm. sending is in your own handwriting, mm -hmm. he has another hundred and five letters in your Pierce, handwriting. It's no yeah, nonsense. Are, are you prepared for him to show? That one. He's maybe and the forged things. I mean, people people forge a lot of things. You think he could, he's, he could successfully write 105 letters to himself? Well, I certainly didn't. No, but you, you admit to sending one. My point is, if it turns out the other 105 are exactly the same handwriting, wouldn't that point? Yeah, to I mean, we would obviously bring in handwriting experts. I didn't do it. Nobody you only, you only sent one letter. Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't sent that guy 106 letters. Do you still email people? Uh, what, what do you mean? Do you send emails? Yeah, yeah. Do you have the same email address you've always had? Um, I, I had six at one point. Why? Um, because I like to keep people on different phones and different emails. Six it's, different it's email accounts? Uh, maybe four. I think it's four to six, yeah. It's, it it's four, easier. Four or it's six? easier. So you have some for your utilities, some mm. for close friends, whatever. Yeah. But six is a lot. Is it? I don't know anybody with six email addresses. You don't know many people then. I know, I know people with four or six emails right. address. But was it four or six? I can't remember. Probably six. Probably how, many, six. how many do you use today? I had four phones. Um, I've got one today, but I only email select friends. And you had you have four phones? Yeah. Um, two broke. They were very, very old. One was brand new and broke, and it's still to be returned to the shop. Mm. I like keeping people on separate phones as well. And maybe that makes me a maniac or a stalker or something. But if you've got somebody on about your electricity bill or somebody on about some work or something, it's, it's nice to keep it separate, you know. So um, I didn't do that in Scotland. You didn't have to. But the volume, of course. Do you, do you think, um, Fiona, do you think mm. if somebody did send someone yeah. 41,000 emails? Three, I think that's excessive, pages, obviously, yeah. Would, would that... To you, would that mean someone's stalking someone? Well, yes and no. I mean, it could be, you know, it could be your wife. It could be, you You know, you're maybe sending emails every day about the kids or something like that. I don't know. 41,000 is a lot. That's how many a day? My maths isn't working this time of night. Um, it's but a it's lot. a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're stalking somebody. They could be great friends. You know, they could have been friends for 50 years or something. Was he ever your friend, Richard Gatt? Uh, no, no. Staff asked me that as well. No, I don't think so. You had a lot of banter with him. Yeah, but banter's one thing. Scottish banter down here is quite kind of welcome. You know, it's not really, it's not really fun city, is it? It's not jokey city. Were you ever in love with him? Yes. Is that a serious question? Yeah. No. No. It's not a question of, by his own admission, mm. he has said that he led you on at times. And he clearly I gave was... him the brush off. He asked me to sleep with him with a big green spot in his face one day. I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. He asked you to do what? He asked me to sleep with him. He said, would I like my curtains fixed? And I laughed. And he said, that's a euphemism. 
you want me to come home with you? And I said, I've got a boyfriend. I so, gave him the brush off big, well, big time, I think. You know, why, it's subtly, why? subtly so, but the bottom line is, I think this him? is behind him. No, I don't fancy him. I don't fancy little boys without jobs. Mm. <laughs> that sounds awful. That sounds really, really callous, but, you know. All right, Greg, what do you got? Okay, so yes, that is excessive. And so maybe she's rational for a change. She starts to give you reasons why somebody could do something. I think, Mark, you hit it earlier, and we've all talked about it. I think the big thing here is she's irrational when it comes to the actions she took might have been bad, but they're not as bad as they're made in the movie. So she's trying to be rational by talking down what she has done to make it seem rational. Hey, I didn't do all the bad things. I said, might have done some of them, but she avoids answering those. That's irrational thinking that you can get away with it by doing it that way, in my opinion. I'll just leave it at that. That's all I'm going to cover. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it's like if you're doing a murder investigation and you say, well, people kill people all the time in combat and self-protection. They kill other people in the, in the electric chair. Uh, they're just kind of going to all the scenarios where this might be acceptable to some people. And I wish I would have been able to craft some of these questions. If you're in the media and you're about to do an interview that you need to surgically sharpen up some questions for, uh, please shoot us an email. We can help. Uh, she was able to wiggle out of Pierce's question here, which is a variation of what's called the punishment question. And in criminal interviews, it would sound like, what do you think should happen to the person who does something like this? Or if somebody kills a person in the street, like this case here, what do you think about that? So he could have nailed her down here, but he moved on and maybe he knew that. But right when, right when Pierce says, were you ever in love with him? We have question reversal, hesitancy, blink rate to a 70, answer repetition, and digital flexion all at the same time. I've got a few more, but I'm going to go short here. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I, I didn't even decide to list the move out of baseline on were you ever in love with him? Because it's, it's probably the biggest move in baseline I think that we get. Clearly, this is a hot question. Uh, clearly, it's hot. Um, and she replies with... I don't find I don't fancy little boys without jobs. So that's uh that's an interesting image to put up because she was chatting with him, they were mates, she says, they had banter together. That's a good friendly atmosphere and now we have a little boy without a job. So we're going from idealization to devaluation there. By, by triggering that question of were you ever in love with him, she has to go for complete devaluation on that. Now, remember, we were talking earlier um, about borderline personality disorder and this idealization to devaluation very, very quickly. How does she idealize him right at the start? Baby reindeer. Let's talk about that. Baby reindeer. Uh, the reindeer is a is a is a symbol of uh, renewed re renewal because the reindeer grows new antlers each each year. So there's there's something fresh, uh, a, a new chance every time. The baby re reindeer is innocent, comes at Christmas at the time of gifts. So you've got this renewed uh, gift of innocence. Essentially, it's the, it's the savior, the baby reindeer. She's made him a savior. But now it's shifted to devaluation. Big green spot on his face. That's Shrek. That's the hunchback of Notre Dame. The green, the carbuncle, Quasimodo. It's the rejection of the uglier self. So she starts with this sense of saviour, and then she instantly goes to the rejection of the ugly. For me, it speaks to what may be her own inner trouble, here, her own inability to deal with some of the uglier side of her. We all have, we all have that. Mm -hmm. How we manage that and how we I how we stop ourselves idealizing other people, only then to retract and devalue them. That's the difference often between what would people would call healthy behaviors and unhealthy behaviors, or in case of what we might be seeing here, just extreme behaviors that we're not normally used to seeing. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This, there's a fantastic example of a barrier here. 
that she creates with that cup or with a glass. Like we've talked about earlier, as she was using it as, as a barrier. When, uh, when she says that's excessive, yeah, she pulls that thing right in front of her, that little glass right in front of her, and then puts her hands down. And then Pierce says 41,000 emails is excessive. And she said, yeah, it could be, a, you know, why would somebody do that? She said it could be to a wife. If you're sending your wife 41,000 emails, something's up. Something's not, something's not working there. You're on a rocket sled to divorce. There's no reason to speak because you would just look over and go, what, what time is it? You wouldn't be sending all these emails, 41,000 emails to a wife. I see what she's trying to do there. You know, you would send a lot of email to your wife, but not 41,000, I wouldn't think. I mean, that sounds a little bit excessive to me. So when she asked, uh, uh, when he asked if Richard Gadd was her friend, she looks down, lowers her voice, and then um, the t with a low tone, she says, eh, no, real long, and stop asking me that. That's painful for her. Her being in love with him, I think, was if she was, is painful for her. So she wants to get away with it or get away from it and is literally telling him, don't ask me that anymore. So I think this is a perfect example of a, a cluster of deception cues or cues that would suggest deception because we're hearing fading facts. We see it, her eyes are closed in some parts of this for way too long. Uh, she illustrates on that on the table and says no, and she again she and when she says no and does that she elongates that no real long because I think that answer is painful for her. So she she considers herself a friend to this guy. I think I think she considers she thinks they're connected somehow. So that's why she winces when he says, "Were you in love with him?" and she does that whole wince and gives that weird answer and stuff. And she looks right down the barrel of the camera, making sure that the audience sees her. So I agree with you guys. I think she's trying to sell this as well because she's got that Netflix thing coming up. <laughs> she's got her lawsuit with Netflix coming up and she wants to make sure people believe her, what she's saying. So that's why she, and, and if you look through these clips, it, you'll notice she looks at the camera quite often, you know, which is a little bit that that's, that's a no-no for the for the the person being interviewed, you know, unless you're asked to, which she is in a couple of videos from now. So that's all I got. Um, Fiona, do you think mm. if somebody did send someone, yeah, forty-one thousand emails, three, I think that's excessive. Message, obviously, yeah. Would, would that to you? Would that mean someone's stalking someone? Well, yes and no. I mean, it could be, you know, it could be your wife. It could be, you you know, you're maybe sending emails every day about the kids or something like that. I don't know. 41,000 is a lot. That's how many a day? My maths isn't working this time of night. Um, it's but a it's lot. a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're stalking somebody. They could be great friends. You know, they could have been friends for 50 years or something. Was he ever your friend, Richard Gay? Uh, no. No. Staff asked me that as well. No, I don't think so. But you had a lot of banter with him. Yeah, but banter's one thing. Scottish banter down here is quite kind of welcome. You know, it's not really it's not really fun city, is it? It's not jokey city. Were you ever in love with him? Yes. Is that a serious question? Yeah. No. No. It's not a question of... By his own admission, mm. he has said that he led you on at times... And he clearly I gave was... him the brush off. He asked me to sleep with him with a big green spot in his face one day. I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. He asked you to do what? He asked me to sleep with him. He said, would I like my curtains fixed? And I laughed. And he said, that's a euphemism. Do you want me to come home with you? And I said, I've got a boyfriend. So... I gave him the brush off big, well... Big time, I think. You know, Why? subtly, subtly so, but the bottom line is, I think this him? is behind him. No, I don't fancy him. I don't fancy little boys. Without jobs. <laughs> that sounds awful. That sounds really, really callous, but, you know. You've got a law continues, degree. Yeah. Law degree. So you're obviously very bright. How did you do a school? I've got a photographic memory. I was top of the school, apart from the science. Um, I which think which the, school was the, that? Belfort High. I went to the science um, person got the most marks because you can get 99% in How many O and, and A levels did you, did you end up with? I got six hires, uh, two X S S Y S and they were all sort of, most were A band ones, which was when, when the A band one was top of the thing. I was, and with your law degree, what did, what grade did you get? Not bad. I mean, oh, all right. What you was know? It? 
uh, I just did an ordinary degree and then a diploma in legal practice. Well, what grade, what grades did you get degree. from? Um, all right grades, all right grades, but, you know, what, I what, went out what, part, what partying. Uh, we d- I didn't do an honours degree, so, you know, just bog standard what, grades, what, really. What degree did you, you did a law degree or...? I did a law degree with 13 subjects, 13 law subjects, so it wasn't the CPE or anything, um, which I also have from down here, but uh, mm. it was 13 law subjects. This was, is from Aberdeen University? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what degree did you end up with? A law degree, and then I did a politics degree after that. And what grade politics, did you get Politics, women's studies. Um, I did substantially better in that because I did more work. You know, I, I think in our day, when you went to university, you did There's a reason, you, you see you've got a photographic memory, but yeah. what, what grade did you get? It, all right grades. I mean, not top of the year or anything. No, no, but you, all right you get grades. Given, you, when you do a degree, you get a... Yeah, oh, you're asking me what marks I got for 13 subjects. I can't remember. Well, no, you but, end up with it. Did you get a first-class degree? Oh, no. Well, I, I said I didn't do an honours degree. I yeah. wanted to go out and practice, so it was an ordinary degree I did. Right, but you can't remember how you did. I, I did all right. I didn't do mm. top of the year. Mm. But you're, the, the other graduates at the same time, they'd all remember you. Some of them remember me. One of them did incredibly well. He's a high court judge. Mm. Uh, some people didn't do well. I think the general idea in the 80s was we didn't really do much work. That sounds absolutely awful. But, you know, that was kind of the 80s. Okay. All right, Chase, what do you got? Pierce asks her 11 times about her grades. 11 times. And I'm wondering why this is so important for her to hide. Uh, she knows the question. It's, it's obvious. There's still no answer. Never answers. So when you say you have a photographic memory, it makes it a lot harder to pretend not to remember stuff and be aloof about numbers and data. And this is avoidance on an Anthony Weiner level. So here's a way to mitigate this if you ever encounter this kind of avoidance in a conversation. Number one, you could say, you know, maybe I'm asking this in a weird way. I'm not sure you, you're trying to avoid answering a simple question, and I'm sure it's it's probably my fault. Here's what I meant to ask you. So there is no getting out of that. You can't back out of that. Uh, the second way you could word this is, was there something about your grades that was really sensitive for you as a topic? I didn't want to offend you at all. It seems that there was a huge wall right there, and I promise I didn't mean to touch on something embarrassing or stressful. For you. That's the way you can get around that stuff. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Or you can be really direct, really direct, right? If you don't want to be too polite and agreed, that's the most, that's the best socially correct and easiest way to go. But there are occasions where you might go the other way where you say, okay, let me get this straight. You got a photographic memory. I ask you a simple question because at the crux of this entire series of videos we've watched, this is the problem. If she does have a photographic memory, good. If she's telling the truth about that, then we know that she has been outright deceptive through nine videos by being vague and non-concise. So she's lied to now, or she's lying about her photographic memory. You can put her on notice about that and say, okay, hold on. But she, to your point, Jay, she goes right back into that, not answering, evading, and even truck drives over and talking at the same time he's talking to try to avoid it. This is more that need to be accepted and you don't want them to see your ugly babies and whatever it takes, you're not going to say, I did poorly in school. She did. I did OK. Well, OK is not good enough. And by the way, if you really have a photographic memory, science facts are just photographs. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, clearly some issues around the the education as you're talking about there. Um, she looks off a quick glance off to the side before she says she has a photographic memory. That's out of her baseline for me. So I'm going to suggest she doesn't have a photographic memory uh, at all. I don't think that's that's true in any way. But clearly she wants to put up a front of ability. And so he checks her on the on the grades. I was educated in the British system around the same time that she was. Scottish system might be slightly different. I don't know. I wasn't educated in Scotland. Uh, and you can tell me down below for the Scots, and I know we have a lot of Scots who uh, who watch this uh, down below whether what the what the nomenclature is. What you know, what are the letters? Because not talking about O levels or A levels or GCSEs, talking about S's or and and then the grades don't like nothing that I understand matches up 
with that. It's a complete bunch of garbage as far as I can see, but maybe I don't know what she's talking about because I'd like to know if she's being honest about those grades and how many, you know, in my world, um, GCSEs and uh, A levels, O levels or A levels, she talk and what those grades were, because that would give us a good idea of is she at a potentially savant level? You know, is she, you know, top of the of the class? Because then she gets to university, went to a very good university, by the way, uh, in my mind. And but she doesn't know the grades. Um, she took 14, like she didn't do a, a an honours degree. Okay, I kind of understand what you say, kind of, but doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then she's, she replaces those grades with 80s partying that everybody was doing and we were doing, we were doing. So so she make, she replaces it with that social thing of we were just all out partying. And I guess, you know, being social, here's the interesting thing for me, being social will impair your performance uh, uh, cognitively or intelligently. You can't do one and you can't do the other. And because we were all out partying or she was partying, then she doesn't get good grades. Well, no, some people do both. Some people parted in the 80s and they did really well at university at the same time. There's some people who can handle all of that. And it sounds to me like you maybe had a high court judge that you were at university with who did, if everybody was out partying, like he studied to the level where he became a high, high, high court judge and parted at the same time. All of this to say, it's now all falling to bits at this point. It's complete, it's a house of cards and none of it is making a lot of sense at all. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to test out the new Zoom reaction thing. I didn't know it would fill the whole screen. So. Uh, that's funny. All right. Well, he fights for about 30 seconds to get to get her to answer the question about what her grades were. And again, go back to everybody's point. If she had a photographic memory, she looked at a report card, be it digital or it's probably analog back then. She would have remembered that. It would have made a picture photographic memory. It would have made a picture in her brain and she wouldn't have any problem recalling that whatsoever. But she fights and pushes back and squirms around, tries to get away from answering that just as hard as she possibly can. And, he, you know, finally, he kind of lets her go on it, you know, because he, he sees it's going nowhere. But while she's doing all this, then you see him do it, that purse lips and then they go to the side. I think it, quite often that means you don't agree with what's happening or you see a, a different outcome when they go to the side. You see a, an, out, an alternative outcome to what's happening. In this case, I don't think it was that. I think it's him trying to try not to say, um, I know you're full you're of liar. it. You're yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know you're full of it and you're squirming and I can see it and soaking it. I think that's what that is. He's trying to hold it, hold back what he thinks uh, he's going to say. Her blink rate's all over the place, but at the same time, with all this going on, she's locked down in this head-to-head -head battle to make sure she's believed. And that's why she keeps checking the camera. She wants she, she wants to be believed so bad she can't stand it because who she is, who she's created in her brain and her mind, is now being confronted with reality. And that that can be really dangerous when you're dealing with a person like that. Really dangerous. There's no sometimes there's no telling what could happen in those situations. So I think that's why he was watching his mouth because he's, you can't just pop off like that because that person may be in, end up doing some stuff that you wouldn't be responsible for, but you triggered uh, those actions they would take because of the, you, you coming on so strong with your questioning, especially when you already think you, you're under the impression, you know, the answers to. So in some of these cases, you got to be real careful with who you're talking to because you never know what some, someone's going to do when you get them a uh, boxed in a corner like that. Right. You got a law degree. Years, yeah. Law degree. So you're obviously yeah. very bright. How did you do at school? I've got a photographic memory. I was top of the school, apart from the science. Um, I which think which the, school was the, that? Uh, Balfour and High. I went to the science um, person, got the most marks because you can get 99% in the How many O and A levels did you, did you end up with? I got six hires. Uh, two X S S Y S and they were all sort of most were A band ones, which was when when the A band one was top of the thing. I was, and with your law degree, what did, what grade did you get? Not bad. I mean, oh, all oh, right. What you was know, 
uh, I just did an ordinary degree and then a diploma in legal practice. Well, what grade, what grades did you get degree. from? Um, all right grades, all right grades, but, you know, what, I what, went what, out what, part, what were they? partying. We d- I didn't do an honours degree, so, you know, just bog what, standard grades, what, what really. What degree did you, you did a law degree or...? I did a law degree with 13 subjects, 13 law subjects, so it wasn't the CPE or anything, um, which I also have from down here, but uh, mm. it was 13 law subjects. This was, is from Aberdeen University? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what degree did you end up with? A law degree, and then I did a politics degree after that. And what grade politics, did you get Politics, women's them? studies. Um, I did substantially better in that because I did more work. You know, I think in our day, when you went to university, you did... There's a reason, you say you've got a photographic memory, but yeah. what, what grade did you get? It, all right grades. I mean, not top of the year or anything. No, no, but you, all right you get grades. Given, you, when you do a degree, you get a... Yeah, oh, you're asking me what marks I got for 13 subjects. I can't remember. Well, no, you but, end up with it. Did you get a first-class degree? Oh, no. Or? Well, I, I said I didn't do an honours degree. I yeah. wanted to go out and practice, so it was an ordinary degree I did. Right, but you can't remember how you did. I, I did all right. I didn't do mm. top of the year. Hmm. But you're, the, the other graduates at the same time, they'd all remember you. Some of them remember me. One of them did incredibly well. He's a high court judge. Mm. Uh, some people didn't do well. I think the general idea in the 80s was we didn't really do much work. That sounds absolutely awful. But, you know, that was kind of the 80s. It came- OK, I had to give that to Chase. Sorry, Greg. It was the expression. Greg's just yeah, lazy no. about it. you got to put in more effort, Greg. You'll win That's some exactly effort. right. I am very lazy. Well, <laughs> it's his what face is it? Is it what? No, it's, it's an irrelevant face. Yeah. No, it was it was um irrational. Irrational. That's irrational. Right. If it came to it, would you would you take a lie detector test? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, possibly, yeah. I would need to consult other lawyers about that. If we that. set one up, you would do it. A lie detector test for what? You know, I well, might no, stop the, the police, or As you know, the police use them. Um, they're just an indication. They use you. them for mass murder and things like that. Um, well, no, they actually, they yeah, use them in many um, cases just to determine whether they think someone's telling the truth. They don't use them that much. I know you've done the programmes of women behind bars and mm. things. I, I, I confess, I think I've just seen one. But it's not used that much. Well, look, I'll be honest with you. I've had other things. Since yeah. you mentioned it, like, I've, done yeah. lot, I've done a lot of crime interviews with people who've committed mm. way worse offences than what you've been accused yeah, of. Yeah, I haven't seen um, I know you have. You know, way, way more. Mass murderers, serial killers and so on. And, it, you know, they're all, I've got to say, almost all of them are very good liars. Could it be, people to be asking this, watching you thinking, either she's genuinely innocent here mm. or she's a terrible liar who is capable of all of these things. I don't lie, and um, I I tell white lies if I absolutely have to, like Mm. when my 94-year-old ex-neighbour was dying. We all knew she was dying, and I'd phoned her in the hospital the night before, and I lied and said, you know, have a good sleep, everything's going to be fine and that. You know, know, so I'll tell a white lie like that Mm. when somebody clearly needed some rest. How many many times did you meet Richard Gerd? Don't know. What would you guess? Five, six, maybe five, six times. That's it? Yeah. In your life? Yeah. Yeah. How do you think it's come to this, if that's all true? I think he wanted to make money. I think he picked on somebody. There was a backstory there with that stalker article out there, right? So stalking's in vogue, going to prison's in in vogue. Um, What do writers say or English Mm. lecturers or something? Write about what you know. And to people who are watching, look down the barrel of that camera. To people who are watching this and who still doubt you, what do you say to them? I think you should watch this. I think you should look at the number of articles that Richard Gadd and Jessica, the actress, have done and how Netflix and he have promoted this. Um, I think you should look at um, him saying, I am some sort of mental case and judge for yourselves because I can't change your mind on this. Um, I can just rebut what has been said. You need to make up your own minds. But my mind is made up. He's a liar. And my friends say likewise. Fiona Harvey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, When he asks if she would be willing to take a lie detector test, she exhibits what I call the porky pig pattern. 
And it has nothing to do with the way someone looks. It has everything to do with the way someone talks. She gives that she all but says but yeah, but yeah, before she gives the answer because she's thinking she's structuring that that's a problem for her because she's already said yeah you know yeah no problem and now she's thinking whoops I shouldn't have done that uh, she's under the impression that that the lie detector test would uh, prove her uh, would show the truth <laughs> anyway so uh, she's all fired up with, with this answer and wants to get out as soon as she possibly can. And that's what kicks in the porky pig pattern, because once she starts answering and that hits her brain that that's not right, you can't do that. She's trying to to find some time to create that answer. When you lie, your brain has to do three things. First thing it's got to do is keep you from telling the truth. It's going to say, hang on, man, just a second. You can't do that. We, can, we can't lie. Something's not right here. So it stops you. And then your brain goes, well, we have to make up a lie. We have to make up the lie. So you create the lie. Then the third thing it does, it delivers the lie. And that's what we're seeing here. If it is a lie, then that's what we're seeing here. And that's why that pause was there. Because her brain goes, hang on, we can't do that. We, can, we can't do that. And it starts creating the rest of the answer. So she answers to the camera. And she's fairly comfortable this whole time with the camera. She just doesn't seem to have much problem. I mean, we see her stress go up a lot, but she's sort of comfortable on camera, I think. As well, she keeps checking peers as she's as she's uh, looking down the barrel of the camera. She keeps checking him to make sure he believes her because she knows that's important and wants to make sure she knows this is the end. There's going to be a wrap up and he's going to say whatever he's going to say. She's making sure that he believes her. And at the same time, she's sort of connecting with him to, to, for their for the relationship they've created on the show so far. And after that, there's not much that on here that we haven't seen already, I don't think. Greg, what do you got? I think there are two identical behaviors that if you're not paying attention, you'll think they're different. The first one is that, of course, well, maybe. That's what I, I would categorize it. Yeah, I'll do it. Well, maybe. But it's only for serious stuff. And what she's doing is initially coming out of the gate with what you need to hear and then realizing, well, I better be careful. I need to condition what I said because it could get me in trouble later and walking through it. And if you don't believe she's doing that, watch how uncomfortable she becomes as she adjusts her clothes and her seat position as she goes in that chaff and redirect about what kinds of people do it. And yeah, I know you've talked to murderers and, and, and then checks her watch for the first time in this entire video. So that's interesting. And the second behavior that is identical is I don't lie, but when I do. She says, I don't lie. And she says, unless it's a little white lie. And then she explains about a dying neighbor because both of those are identical behaviors. They're the same thing we've seen her do all along. That is answer the question in a way that she thinks will be ideal and then rationalize and throw out, I have four phones in the process so that when she gets caught later, you don't act aggressively toward her. This is not something that a person learns to do today. This is years and years and years. So she's hedging so that when she gets caught later, she's not in trouble. There are at least five or six um, lip compressions that are out of baseline for her here as well. Then when she goes to this down the chute and we see the jib shadow, she does a prepared statement that you can't miss. Listen to the cadence, the pitch, and watch your blink rate. You can't miss it. Look, this has not done you a whole lot of good here going through this and saying, yeah, maybe. And then I don't lie, but when I do, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, this was a pretty dog blind. This is a classic read technique question here. Would you take a polygraph and how do you think you would do on a polygraph? So the aim being not to get them to agree to do the polygraph, but to see how they respond to being asked the question about a polygraph. And right here, where there's a rising in vocal pitch, head shaking no when she's saying yes, there's hesitancy, a loss of verbal fluency, changing the answer. And, and then a diminishing answer, possibly. So one is emphatic, one is softened. Her chance to say what she wants uh, to the people, and we never heard what everyone was waiting to hear. This was it. This was her chance. We All of us are waiting for her to say, none of this is true. They are lying. I didn't do this. Instead, we get, my mind is made up that he's a liar. Not that he's a liar. Just that her mind is made up that and her friends agree with that. That's different than a denial. So that's all I got there. Mark? Uh, yeah, look, here's the key themes for me as she goes down the lens. He and Netflix have promoted this. That means they've 
elevated, promoted, they've elevated to a higher level. Um, him saying, I'm some kind of mental case. Now, you know, most of the time we're going to expect that somebody who's who's framed as a mental case has gone down in status. So they've gone up in status and she, causing her to go down in status. Uh, and now she wants the public to judge. She needs judgment. She's been, I would suggest, she feels she's been scorned publicly. She's been publicly humiliated by this. She needs judgment on this. She needs rep retribution. She needs a rebalance on this uh, for, an, for an act that has caused society to reject her. I mean, here we are paying attention to her, but my guess is, is she's getting more negative in her mind, and it's probably true, she's getting more negative judgment than she is positive judgment. And for her, that is the worst possible thing that is imaginable at the moment for the whole, because she, I would suspect, uh, just my opinion, she has a very, very hard time with how relationships work, a really hard time with that. And so what's the worst thing possible? But the whole of Britain and the world looks at her and goes, we think you're very odd and we don't like you at all. And potentially that's what's happening for her right now. She sees that. She knows that there's been X million made by this. I don't think she's after the millions, though she might get it. She's after what that would mean. If she won in court, it would mean she's not some kind of mental, and therefore the world can now look at her as a very um, likable, lovable person. I, I, I was about to say ordinary, because maybe she does want to feel something quite ordinary in her relationships. If it came to it, would you, would you take a lie detector test? Yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. I would need to consult other lawyers about that. If we that. set one up, you would do it. A lie detector test for what? You know, I might well, no, stop the, the or police, or As you know, what? the police use them. Um, they're just an indication. They really. use them for mass murder and things like that. Um, well, no, they actually, they yeah. use them in many cases just to determine whether they think someone's telling they the truth. They don't use them that much. I know you've done the programmes of women behind bars and mm. things. I, I, I confess, I think I've just seen one, but it's not used that much. Well, no, I'll be honest with you. Since, have a thing. since yeah. you've mentioned it, like, I've, done yeah. lot, I've done a lot of crime interviews with people who've committed mm. way worse offences than what you've been accused yeah, of. Yeah, I haven't seen um, it. And we have. You know, way, way more. Mass murderers, serial killers and so on. And, it, you know, they're all, I've got to say, almost all of them are very good liars. Could it be, people to be asking this, watching you thinking, either she's genuinely innocent here mm. or she's a terrible liar who is capable of all of these things. I don't lie, and um, I, I tell white lies if I absolutely have to, like mm. when my 94-year-old ex-neighbour was dying. We all knew she was dying, and I'd phoned her in the hospital the night before, and I lied and said, you know, have a good sleep, everything's going to be fine and that. You know, you know so I'll tell a white lie like that mm. when it, somebody clearly needed some rest. And How many, how know, many times did you meet Richard Gerd? Don't know. What would you guess? Five, six, maybe five, six times. That's it? Yeah. In your life? Yeah. Yeah. How do you think it's come to this, if that's all true? <sighs> I think he wanted to make money. I think he picked on somebody. There was a backstory there with that stalker article out there, right? So stalking's in vogue, going to prison's in, vo in vogue. Um, what do writers say or English mm. lecturers or something? Write about what you know. And to people who are watching, look down the barrel of yeah, that camera. I'm looking to people who are watching this and who still doubt you, what do you say to them? I think you should watch this. I think you should look at the number of articles that Richard Gadd and Jessica, the actress, have done and how Netflix and he have promoted this. Um, I think you should look at um, him saying, I am some sort of mental case and judge for yourselves because I can't change your mind on this. Um, I can just rebut what has been said. You need to make up your own minds. But my mind is made up. He's a liar. And my friends say likewise. Fiona Harvey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, we've watched these videos. We've taken a look at her body language and her behavior. 
And I'm sure we've all four made decisions about what we've seen. Mark, what have you seen? Yeah, look, if, if we did have borderline personality disorder, uh, autism spectrum disorder, and uh, delusional disorder all in one space, that wouldn't be unusual for the Hawley Arms. For those of you who've been at the Hawley Arms uh, late on a Friday night, Saturday night, you know, there's more of that than you can possibly uh, imagine. Um, so, so that's not unusual. But it is unusual, I think, for us, if that were the case, to have that all in one um, one bundle. Um, I wonder whether we're seeing that. I'm not sure. Uh, my opinion on that. Chase. I've got a private coaching group that I teach every Sunday at 5 p.m. This past week, the the title of our topic that we were really doing a deep dive on is called The Fear of Social Wounds and how to exploit social wounds and understand and what they are. We're seeing that here. This is a person with a fear of social wounding and being wounded socially. And I can, uh, and this is all of our opinion only, just our opinion. And let me sum up what uh, a person like this might be saying, and I'll do it in one paragraph. This is true-ish, uh, but it's not totally true. I might have done a whole lot of weird stuff, but not that weird. And it might have been crazy, but it wasn't that crazy. That's what we're really seeing. Greg? Yeah, this reminds me of Big Bang Theory. I'm not crazy. I've been tested. It's one of those things where outlandish behavior might not be as bad as what they're saying, and you're going to try to mitigate, and you don't have the social skills to mitigate. The right answer from a, a rational, normal acting person would have been to go in and say, look, yeah, they exaggerated. We may have done X, Y, and Z. I may have sent too many emails. I may have broke. But when you're not rational and you don't handle rejection well, this is public rejection on a grand scale. The only thing I would have advised this woman to do is do not go talk to Piers Morgan because he is going to be merciless. And he was. Scott, what do you got? He sure was. I've got a video that just came out called The Psychopathic Stare. Some of the behaviors we're seeing in here, we're seeing in some of the questions that are asked uh, from viewers in that video. So these things may seem new or whatever these behaviors, but they're actually quite common among the ASD situation that Mark and Chase were talking about and other things that we've seen before. Now, in, a, in wrapping all this up, I think I'm kind of on the side of Netflix on this because I think what they'll do is they'll sue the squad out of that, that I would think out of that guy, uh, the guy who wrote this thing and told him, yeah, this is all true. This is all true. Even though they should have maybe checked, you know, done a little background check on all this to make sure stuff is true. Um, I think they, I mean, I feel, I feel, don't feel bad for him, but I feel like they sort of got the short end of the stick on this because this cat came in saying, yeah, man, this is all true. Like, you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. But then again, like Mark was talking about at the beginning where they say at the end, it's based on a true story. I don't know. Maybe they can squirm out of this, you know, I don't know. But I think the guy is definitely in a lot of trouble over all that. All right, fellas, thanks. It's another good one. And we'll see you next time. So what do you got? Nope. <laughs>